10, it's just a cold sore. The Victorian era is cool. The art, the fashion, and technology of the time, I think, are always fun to take a look at, especially since steampunk has its roots in the Victorian era, and who doesn't like steampunk? Come on, there's just a lot of cool steampunk stuff. And honestly, we haven't seen a lot of that in a long time. We need, we need more, we need more. Something not so cool from that era, however, was what you could catch from another person should you decide to take up a bed with another person. Syphilis, yep, one heck of a disease. Funny enough, it was so common that it was making intimacy itself an unusual practice. People were scared, and honestly, maybe rightfully so. There's no cure, and if it progresses to its later stages back then, well, you'd go crazy. And then you'd end up being that guy that's always screaming in the streets. Every city has one. You know what I'm talking about. Number nine, the French letter. The issues of intimacy and its repercussions were becoming quite clear in the Victorian era. Something had to be done, as spending any amount of time in the brothels could have you shucking barnacles off your lower deck in the morning, if you know what I mean. Introducing the revolutionary new invention, prophylactics. For those that are college age, you might find it disturbing that these party favors weren't made of rubber or disposable. Yeah, hear me out. They were made of sheep's guts and they had to be soaked first so they would become flexible. Because when you put these bad boys on, they had to be fastened on. It's not very good, not very attractive. Once the deed had been signed off on, the device was then washed and then hung up to dry like your dirty laundry. Once it was dry, it was placed in a small box for the next time. Because seeing your wife's ankles might make you feel a certain kind of way and now you just have it ready to go. And Number eight, the products of our sins. Having fun when the lights can be turned off is great. Who doesn't enjoy a little toe curling, yeah? Except sometimes there's this crazy thing that can happen, where after nine months, another human spawns in. Insane, right? I know. Well, back in the Victorian era, this phenomenon was happening, but only for married couples. As you have to be married, of course, or else a child would be born out of wedlock, which to people at the time was just the worst. Oh, I never. These stigmas were not favorable for women, as some preferred to avoid that kind of press by abandoning or straight up just unaliving their children. Horrible, just, just horrible times. Just another one of those good old wholesome times in history where we were treating women with the utmost respect and decency. Very nice. We were actually not very nice. Number seven, diet. Bedroom misconduct was becoming a huge issue. Refer to number nine and 10. While women did get most of the blame because, well, you know, history, men did get some of the blame. The issue of intimacy for men could be described as barbaric primal sense. So how do we curb this? How do we stop men from acting on these caveman urges, ooga booga? Well, simple really. Men just have to stop eating certain foods, as it was thought at the time that food had a link to the misconduct, or rather, the overabundance of bedroom related issues, including mustard, pepper, rich gravy, beer, wine, cider, and tobacco. And if you weren't paying attention, that's basically the diet of every man in Victorian times. Not sure how a jar of finely prepped mustard would get you flustered, but okay, sure. The beer makes sense though, you know, have a few beers, and even the mop leaning over in the corner looks pretty lonely and Boy, that mop has lovely hair. Number six, job market. Ladies of the evening, women of the night. Women who make beds go bump in the night. They were everywhere in Victorian London, a lot. It's partially related to some of the points I previously mentioned. Now, I'm not here to say it's necessarily a bad thing. Personally, I don't think it is. As they say, it's the oldest profession in the book, with an estimated 80,000 women working in the night by the late 1890s. You'd have to be crazy to miss that. I mean, they, they were literally everywhere. With numbers like that, there's something for everyone and in varying price ranges, as they can be found in brothels or townhomes set up by the wealthy men for their mistresses, pretty much anywhere trouble likes to spawn. Even some artists took advantage of this by living with the gorgeous girls of the evening, as going behind closed doors with one was debatable, but becoming friends? Now that's a social transgression. That, oh, becoming friend. Oh, how dare you befriend the people of the night? Number five, Jolly Lad. When people think about certain magazines that depict lewd imagery, you probably only think of Playboy. The bunny imagery was good marketing, honestly, just, just smart. But what if I told you the Hefmeister wasn't the first to publish such a magazine or imagery? Back in the Victorian era, there was some saucy imagery being produced. The government had outlawed such indecency, but this only made the lewd picture industry move underground, where naturally, it flourished, especially in major cities. And if you knew where to go and how to ask for one, you could purchase something from the hidden menu. 
Kind of like when you go to McDonald's. Yeah, there's a hidden menu there too. Google it and see for yourself. I'd repeat what my favorite one is, but I would be in trouble from the YouTube gods. And I've been treading on thin ice this whole video, so. Uh, number four, the first counterculture. The 1960s were a very important time for many different people. Black Americans were fighting for the rights. Music went from holding hands to strawberry fields, if you know what I'm saying. And everything that your parents told you just, just kind of felt wrong. If you grew up then, you know what I mean. I know people like to make fun of hippies, but there was some good ideas there. Well, in 1890s England, they were sort of having the same thing happen. Obviously, not as strong as a push as it was in the 60s, but still. Basically, after all the oppression towards bedroom relations, people began to open up. Uh, not literally, just, just open up thinking-wise. That's really gross, don't repeat that. There's only one way we all got here. Unless you're a test tube baby, of course. In that case, thank you for watching CT133576-2. To some historians, this makes sense. When you push and push for things to happen or ban, eventually people will push back, especially if it's something like bedroom time. Everybody, everybody likes a little bit of bedroom time. Valentine's Day wasn't too long ago. Remember that? It was good. It was fun. It was good, good fun. Number three, Jack the Ripper. While the man's numbers don't compare to any of the other horrible people in history, he's unusual because of his brutality and the fact that he was never caught. Jack the Ripper was maybe the first modern serial on a liver. He haunted the streets of Victorian London and is responsible for claiming multiple women's lives, women of the evening to be exact, and they began to know the name Jack the Ripper. Now we'll probably just have to show you pictures of Victorian London or maybe some b-roll of a shadowy figure because there ain't no way we can show the crime scenes. There's probably a dozen different theories on who done it. Some say it was multiple men using his name as an alias, some say it was Prince Albert, there's even some who suggest that he was a she, and which explains why women were so easy to go off with Jack. That actually kind of makes sense to me at least, and why no one really would be looking for a woman back then. Kind of makes sense. Anyway, be careful out there ladies, just, just be careful. Number two, Queen Victoria. It seems old blighty herself may have been a tad more promiscuous than you'd think a royal to be. Well, not with other men, but her husband who in her diary claims to be the love of her life, which honestly is kind of sweet and, and romantic, that's nice. One thing that I find interesting, however, is that while lewd images were outlawed, the queen may have commissioned a painting of herself that was quite risque for the time. To gift to her husband, of course. Hypocrisy much? I say lewd, but it was probably just in her loose-fitting clothes with maybe like an ankle showing or something. Still, unusual behavior for the queen. I'll remember that the next time, Bly. I'll remember that. Number one, Prince Albert. If you've ever stepped foot into a tattoo parlor, then you might know where I'm going with this. Prince Albert, the husband of Queen Victoria, had some controversy circulating his name. One, because he shares a name with another Prince Albert, who was speculated to be Jack the Ripper, but also because of a very unique piercing. Go ahead and take a guess where that piercing is. Yeah, I didn't think so. As a man, if your anatomy could be described by an internet comedian using moderately funny euphemisms, then the piercing would go through your German army helmet. That makes sense, right? The horror. The absolute horror. It's rumored that he had one of these piercings. Did he? Ah, I'm not sure. But if it means anything to you, Nicholas II had a tattoo, so it's not completely out of the realm of possibility. Kicking off the list at number 10, Ramses II. Ramses II, part two, you see what I'm doing here. He's considered one of the greatest, if not the greatest pharaoh of the 19th dynasty. Ramses II is still considered the ruler of rulers. It's not a bad title, not bad at all. In year 30 of his reign, Ramses II was ritually transformed into an Egyptian god. Not bad, I'm turning 30 in a few years. I hope someone turns me into a god or gets me like a bike. <laughs> one of the two, I'll take both. So it was only fair that the spoiled pharaoh erected a bunch of statues of himself. Yeah, big selfies. Ramses put up more selfies than any other pharaoh in history. Most famous of them, the temples of Abu Simbel. There lies a monument dedicated to the late Queen Nefertiti and the Ramseum. We kicked off a part one with Ramses signing the first ever peace treaty, so, so for part two we had to show some of the glamour side of him, you know? Number nine, over 100 children. Who is this guy, Nick Cannon? Ramses II is the father to over 100 children. Uh, with that, of course, came the, you know, 200 wives, otherwise, ow and how, if it was just one person, ow and how, you know? <laughs> it's guesstimated that Ramses had 96 sons and 60 daughters. Of all those children, Ramses outlived a lot of them. It's almost like living as a king helped, perhaps, maybe, I don't know, maybe you ate better. Maybe, just a hint, just an idea. Eventually, Ramses was succeeded by his 13th son with his favorite queen, Queen Nefertari, giving her the fanciest tomb in the Valley of the Queens. Nefertari's tomb contains paintings that some consider are the greatest works of ancient Egyptian art. Not bad, I had like baseball wallpaper on mine growing up. 
Tomb QV66. He spoiled his lady. Look at this. We gotta love him. Her tomb is 520 square meters covered in beautiful art, but in 1904 when Nefertari's tomb was rediscovered, all that was found was her mummified knees. Yeah, all that was left was her kneecaps. What, like, who does this? Raiders had stolen all the treasure prior, sometime in the many moons she had been lying there, and they even took her body and left her knees. Like, what? Monsters. They're like, yeah, grab the treasure, leave the patellas. Let's do it. Number eight, ready to strike. Pharaohs may have looked beautiful living in after death, but they meant business, okay? They were protective of their land, their family, their many, many lovers and children. The symbol often worn by pharaohs were symbols of power, a Nemes crown. This crown was a striped headcloth and the back of their head was covered with an aureus symbol, AKA an upside down cobra. The cobra symbol represents that the pharaoh is always ready and willing to attack their enemies, attack them with venom. It's a pretty cool symbol. Mine just says DC Etnies Shoes. I'm like, I don't, this says fight me, if anything. DC Skate Shop in my back. I'm like, yeah, you can just attack me, that's cool. Number seven, King Teddy. The Pyramid of Teddy was built for the first ruler of the sixth dynasty. While it's not as flashy or massive as other pyramids, inside it contains the oldest writing ever, in the religious world, that is. Inside it contains the pyramid texts, these legendary texts. They go all the way back to 2400 BC. The pyramid texts were specifically written so that this king, King Teddy, could ascend to the heavens after his death. This isn't bizarre behavior by any means, but King Teddy, he was specific. He wanted to be a star, like a literal star. There are spells and incantations that are in this tomb meant to free the king's soul as he arrives in the cosmos. More specifically for Teddy to become a star in the sky and join Osiris and Orion in the hashtag God Squad. There's even instructions on how to preserve the body and travel to these heavens. It's one thing to be buried with your gold, then you can live another life, but to become a star? I need to expand my dreams, my gosh. King Teddy was onto something here. When I go in my will, I'm gonna be like, can I become a star, is that possible? Can I just throw me up into the heavens? Can I do that? Or bury me, that's cool. Bury me in Ajax, that works. <laughs> Number six, Yozer. For this one, we're looking into some bowl worshiping. So if you're a fan of bowls, here, this one's perfect for you, weirdly enough. Just north of the Steppe Pyramid of Pharaoh Dozier, archeologist August Mariette discovered this site in 1851. The Serapium, it's a temple dedicated to the Egyptian deity Serapis, and it's a combination of Osiris and Apis in human form. This was a large burial ground for the Apis bulls, these bulls that were said to be sacred, of course, and after their death, they would become immortal. Immortal bulls, that sounds badass, and also terrifying, that's very scary. Don't wear red around these guys. Today at Saqqara, there's a massive vault, it's 382 yards long, and it's carved out of sandstone bedrock, it's huge, and along the sides, there's 24 chambers, each with a sarcophagus carved out of a single chunk of granite. Just impossible craftsmanship all around. Especially at these times, like, oh my god, my wrists are tired just typing about this, let alone doing this. Inside these boxes were animal remains, bones and all that jazz, but back in those times, you weren't allowed to break up any bodies. You had to mummify them, right? Hence part one and where we are now. How are these tombs built so perfectly, weighing over 80 tons, and also, where do these bones come from? I have so many questions. Maybe on part three, we'll answer them. Number five, we love cats. I am allergic to cats, but I still go for it. I still pet them. I risk everything just to... Yes, I don't care. I ruined my entire weekend just to get my face all up in their whiskers. Nobody did it like ancient Egyptians. You've probably heard this at one point or another. They worshipped cats. They were like, you know, the legendary <laughs> cats. That was, that was their thing. I'm more of a golden retriever guy, but I get it, they're cute. They respected them, they worshipped them. Even though at the time, dogs were respected for being hunters, cats were still considered magical creatures. It's because they just stare at shit randomly. Mid-conversation, a cat will just be like, no, they're not magical, they're terrifying. They're on something. If you had a cat, you had good luck, apparently. A friend of mine has two fat cats. He has some pretty good luck, I think. If they're fat, they're good? Hmm. When a cat passed away back in ancient Egyptian times, they too were mummified. You would think that alone was just plenty of respect, but ancient Egyptians and pharaohs, they would obviously go a step further. Hence this fun list. After their cat died, they would shave their eyebrows off and would mourn them until they grew back. That's like three and a half months of cat depression. That's wild. That's, I, I got over my childhood animal in like six business days. It's not a bad thing, it's just that's a long time, you know? Next time your friend tells you their cat passed away, tell them if they really love them, they would shave their eyebrows. Test them. Number four, ancient Photoshop. 
When we look back at ancient artwork, we see these kings and queens, well, all the pharaohs were considered kings, but it was equal at the time. And they all look athletic. They all look like these warriors, right? They look to be in great shape. When in reality, a lot of these pharaohs were probably pretty overweight or unhealthy. I mean, think about it. If you slam wine and bread all day, plus a little dab of honey every eight minutes, you're gonna gain some weight. Yeah, that's how it goes. Many of these ancient pharaohs did have diabetes, and Queen Hatshepsut, who was alive during the 15th century BC, her sarcophagus shows her as slim and strong and all that jazz, but almost all historians agree that she was out of shape and quite unhealthy. Honestly, fair. I would do the exact same thing. She was ahead of her time. If somebody was like, hey, I'm gonna make a statue for you. What should I make it look like? I'm like, no, yeah, give him an eight pack. Make him jacked. I don't know. Make him look like Michael Jordan. I don't know. Number three, gender reveal parties. Okay, we've seen all these videos online. A guy goes to swing and hit a baseball. He misses, it hits the ground. There's a big pink cloud of smoke. Everyone's like, oh my God gender reveal parties, right? They're pretty popular. Turns out they're popular back in ancient Egyptian days, but nobody did it like them. Also, nobody started any wildfires back then when any uh, ancient Egyptians did it, so that's nice. We should go take a note from them. Back in the day, Egyptians had a pretty interesting method for predicting the gender of a newborn. You would have to use wheat and barley seeds. You would have to pee on them, and then however it grew, that would determine the sex. I would feel bad. First of all, I'd be like, hi, we're curious. Don't mind us. I'm just gonna pee on your crops, sir. Let us know how it grows. We're really aiming towards a boy this time. We have 96 girls, so we're gonna try a couple of boys. Yeah, depending on how the crops grew, they could accurately predict the sex of the child, and it worked a lot of the time. It's pretty wild. We went from watering crops to burning them down just to find out a gender. Hashtag it's a boy. Number two, more tattoos. More tattoos for number two. We love it, you guys saw what I did. Ancient Egyptians worshiped animals. We talked about that, the whole cat stuff, and the whole hippo situation in part one, that was violent. But what about baboons? Did they get any love? Baboons, I say it weird, baboons, baboons. They were pretty important pieces to this ancient Egyptian puzzle. Some mummies were found with tattoos of baboons on their bodies. One of the most strange things pharaohs did back in ancient Egyptian days was train baboons to make arrests. Yep, stop resisting, you're going to jail. Me and seven baboons, let's carry them into the car, bam. Imagine stealing food for your family just to like try and get by and four baboons pop out, start doing parkour and then arrest you in front of everyone. That'd be so embarrassing and also alarming. They trained baboons to pick fruit, make beer and even entertain. Yeah, these baboons were the life of the party apparently. Their dance moves alone would be reason enough to get a tattoo on one of my arms, honestly. Going all crazy, throwing their own at people, I'd be like, yeah, right here or here, I don't care. And finally, number one, the afterlife. One of the most fascinating parts about these ancient Egyptian pharaohs is that they would pass away literally covered in gold, head to toe. It's nice to know that this long ago, some of these kings and queens still rest untouched by grave robbers or explorers. The afterlife for these pharaohs was important. And as soon as they take on the throne, work is immediately underway on their tomb. That's a little grim when you think about it. It's like, hey, congratulations. We're gonna start making where you're gonna be buried. It's like. Thanks, I think. These monuments took time, but they were built to last, and clearly, they have. Pharaoh's eyes were painted black with coal. They did this so that they would look like the god Horus after they passed on. Number 10, snake eyes. Well, not exactly snake eyes, but after extended use of belladonna drops in the eyes, you would probably wish that a snake bit you in the eyes. Belladonna is poisonous. It's a no-cal zone, red flag but yet it was still used by Egyptian royalty. Basically, the drops of poison would dilate your pupils, and that would be considered to be beautiful. For some reason, I guess, okay. Extended use of the drops had terrible side effects for the user, blindness being one of them. You gotta remember, folks this time have no social security, and the best doctors can do for you is tell you to go take a bath in crocodile dung and to pray to the gods for more, I guess. Sure, okay. So to avoid that tragedy, go for the natural look and avoid the eye drops. You'll thank me later. Number nine, more eye stuff. Thought I was done with the eye stuff? Ah, well, guess again, amigo. I ain't done yet. I've got lots more to say about that. Okay, maybe a little. Eye shadow and eye color. Some ladies today would say no special outfit is complete without it. And honestly, I have to agree, ladies. Sometimes y'all do some stuff with your eyes that makes me say, damn, you look good. Damn, you look good. However, some ladies might be cautious to slap some color on their face if they knew the origins of the product. As for the royalty of Egypt, eye makeup was in. It seemed to be a trend. However, they weren't so cautious of where their makeup got its origins. Egyptian eye glitter had two key ingredients. Applicable powder and bugs. Yeah. You know the super colorful ones that are like really big and you wouldn't want to be around? 
Yeah, those. Beetles, scarabs, and pretty much anything you could find. They would then crush them into a heavenly pulp and smear it all over their royal faces. I have issues with spiders and wasps as it is. I have no interest in wearing them whatsoever. I actually hate wasps. That's just even just crushing up a bunch of and just oh, this is good. Oh, I love this. This is the best. Yeah, no, don't do that. Number eight, sweet traps. When you're royalty of one of the most successful empires and civilizations in human history, it means you ain't gonna lift a finger. Less than any other celebrities do today, probably. So what to do with all that extra time in your hands instead of living like everyone else? Well, how about a picnic? That sounds nice, actually. Sounds great, right? Except when we bring out all of our favorite treats. The flies and bugs bother us, and we can't look beautiful if we're covered in bugs head to toe. How did the Egyptians fix this, you ask? Well, it's simple. Don't let the bugs bite you in the first place. Basically, you get one of your forced volunteers, maybe a couple actually, and you slather the poor devils in honey till they look like your favorite pastry from Tim Hortons. Place said glazed serving away from the picnic and now you can enjoy it in sunshine and peace. The screaming of being eaten alive by bugs might dampen the mood, so just, just wear earplugs, it's fine. Just You stay over there and just get eaten, it's fine. No problem. No problem. Number seven, unhooded Sith. Circumcision is important in a lot of cultures of yesterday and today. Now at this channel, my job is to come out here every week and make you laugh. So to the men out there who still have their Jedi robes, imagine every day of your life you got sand in places that sand shouldn't be. Anakin Skywalker's worst nightmare and honestly explains why he hates sand so much. But perhaps one of the reasons Egyptians used this hygiene service was to stop sand getting in their wiener's one-eyed bandit. There's no showers, nothing to really get it out once it's in there. That's no good. I guess you could take a dip in the Nile River, but uh, there's too many crocodiles in there, and who has the time to jump in the Nile River when they're busy being forced to build large structures that will stand the test of time? So you better line up, fellas, or be cursed to feel like Anakin Skywalker for the rest of your life. The prequel one, too, not the, not the cool animated one, the one that whines a lot. That one. You don't want to be that one. Number six, nice dentist. Turns out not all Egyptian dentistry is completely awful. It turns out they may have come up with the first toothbrush. Other civilizations had examples of one too, so it's hard to tell exactly, but the Egyptians had one. But one thing they did have over everyone else were Tic Tacs, or breath mints actually. Honestly, this makes a lot of sense. Imagine it was Valentine's Day, you just walked past a large pyramid. There's sand in places on your body where sand just shouldn't be. When you notice the smell of your breath, and it's something awful. But not to worry, because you purchased breath mints from the market. Yes, that's right. Now smooching with your Egyptian sweetheart can go on without a hitch. The mints were made from nice smelling herbs and mints, sometimes roasted over a fire to form little candies. An ancient Egyptian solution to an ancient Egyptian problem. I kinda like that one actually, kinda nice. Could put a mint in, it's kinda nice. Number five. Oh, I didn't have any corn. Austin Powers reference for you. You know the character I'm talking about, I can't say it. Here's a hygiene product that just makes me question life. The very fabric of our existence. Whether it was the Big Bang or the Almighty Creator, there's just no way this was ever meant to happen. I just, it doesn't make any sense. One day, somebody was walking along the Nile River and was unfortunate enough to step in crocodile droppings. Now, most people would say, gross, and move on. Oh, no, not the people of ancient Egypt. They felt the stinky, squishy unholiness on their feet and said, yes, we must bathe in this. <laughs> and they did. They took the forbidden mud bath, the brown tsunami, the cesspit of no hope. You can call it whatever you want, really. It's, it's horrible either way you look at it. Supposedly, it was meant to keep you young and beautiful. My only question would be at what point did they realize poo baths were a mistake? Was it when they were smelling it and it was bad? Or was it when it accidentally got in your mouth or something like that? And you're just like, oh, what? It, it walked up that out of my mouth. That's the Scottish Egyptian, in case you were wondering. Number four, waste removal. This one is kind of a broad stroke, but hear me out. There's no plumbing, no waste removal, and people kind of just go wherever they want. A lot of that unhygienic waste is kind of just laying about. However, the people of Egypt also had the advantage of the Nile River, which means they used that bad boy for everything. Transport, irrigation, a water source, and of course, a, a bathroom. Which in case you didn't know, your source of water and irrigation should be two separate, that, that shouldn't be, they shouldn't go together, that's not good. This is a good explanation for the plagues of Egypt, besides the sin, bad sinners, no sinning. As years of that kind of negligent waste management are liable to make any pharaoh sick. Don't mix your water with the poo, don't do that, that's bad, don't do that. Number three, sunscreen. This should come as no secret to anyone out there, but with my rosy cheeks and fair complexion, 
I would not do very well on the sons of ancient Egypt. Honestly, I don't know how Luke Skywalker lived on Tatooine with those twin sons. Without a little copper tone action, you know what I'm saying? The Egyptians had an answer to that problem, however. Not the whole living on Tatooine part, that, that just kind of sucks no matter what. Blue milk is weird. They had a makeshift sunscreen using rice bran extracts and a few other ingredients that were meant to help protect against the sun's rays. How effective was it really? Not sure, because the only stuff I'm willing to test out is the real stuff. And if I get burnt, then I start peeling. And then somebody has to rub aloe vera all over me. Be right back, I'm gonna get some sun. Number two, Cursed Craft Dinner. You've got no plumbing in your palace, and it's time for dinner. So how does an Egyptian royal make his favorite pot of KD without water? I mean, if college kids can do it in their dorm room, surely they can master the art of post-secondary cuisine. Well, for some unlucky folks, it means taking a pot and walking down to that old Nile River, almost like people rely on water or something, and take a big scoop of water and bring it back. But while you begin to scoop some water, you may notice someone is picking up crocodile dung. And people are bathing in the water. And, and to your left, there's a maiden washing clothes. And to your right, there's a man doing something I can't repeat on YouTube. Oh well, time to scoop some more water up and consume this clean, nice water at home. Oh, this is the best. Tastes like the village. It's nice. Number one, pink milkshake. Does it still count as hygiene if you ain't breathing? I say yes. Besides the pyramids and maybe the Nile, mummies are the most famous things about Egypt. And in a weird way, it is hygiene. Hygiene for the afterlife. When someone super important passes on, it's time for a little game of operation. Stomach, liver, intestines are removed and put into jars. You never know when you might need that next. The heart is left because it's the heart and the Egyptians were diehard poets, so you gotta souls in there, you gotta keep that. The most grim process to me, however, is turning the human brain into a forbidden milkshake by mashing it with a small spike and then draining it out in what must have been the grossest waterfall ever. I, oh God, that's just, oh God, that's so gross. <laughs> anyway, then you take some linen and start wrapping the mummy up like a dad wrapping last minute gifts on Christmas Eve. Bada bing, bada boom, there you go. Buddy is prepped for the afterlife. Uh, don't mind me, I'm just gonna be sick from the brain milkshake. Ooh. Number 10. Unfaithful. Viking warriors were large, strong, tough, and rough men who drank like fish and partied like it was 1999. And remember, I do. I wouldn't go as far as to call the Coastal Raiders gentlemen, since, well, they were not gentlemen. It's fair to say that they weren't exactly so nice to their women. For example, it wasn't that uncommon for a Viking male to take a bed with his wife. It was also not uncommon for a Viking man to take a bed with someone other than his wife. Which, unless you're a collection of certain people from Utah, that's not okay. Not that I'm here to judge anyone from Utah or the Vikings, but I believe if you fall in love, you gotta stay within those boundaries of that marriage. It's just traditionally a two-person party, not four or five. Number nine, revenge. Signy was a sweet lass who unfortunately married King Seeger, a rather nasty and brutal king. He would earn his malicious title when he had Signy's family unalived, except for her and her twin brother. But wait, there's more. Signy then plotted revenge with her sibling by meeting up with a sorcerer who changed her appearance. She then went back to her brother where they engaged in three nights of awkwardness and shame only a family watching in force ghost form could witness. She then changed forms again to give birth to her son that would assist in her revenge. Eventually they overthrew the Mad King and set him on fire for his misdeeds, where she then also willingly walked into the fire because she felt like she was no longer fit to live. That is one wild story. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, I guess. Number eight, love triangle. There once was a maiden so fair and so beautiful, apparently the most beautiful and smart. Sounds like a winner to me. Gudrun was her name, and she was stuck in an unfortunate love triangle. Kajartan and Boli were friends and foster cousins. Kajartan immediately fell for the beautiful Gudrun. His father, however, did not exactly approve of this fling, as he felt she was kind of sus due to her previous marital adventures. So while holding Kajartan back, Boli went to swoon the beautiful lass. This worked. However, shortly after being distracted by a trip, Kajartan finds out that his love is now in an entanglement with his best friend Boli. This leads to a confrontation where Kajartan is struck with one blow by Boli that claims his life. Boli instantly filled with regret, the same way Anakin felt when confronting Palpatine and Mace Windu. And a what have I done sort of moment. 
It was awkward, but their story was a little bit easier to understand. I don't know, bad dialogue. Number seven, Volun the Smith. Volun the Smith was in love with a Valkyrie, which honestly is just really cool. Come on, I mean, who gets to be in, in love with a Valkyrie? And after a brief marriage, the Valkyrie had to go back to what they do best, which is to pick up soldiers who have perished in battle. As Volund was going full Marvin's room over the grief of his loss, he was kidnapped by a king who imprisoned him to marry his daughter. The king was so serious that he had Volund's hamstrings cut, so he could not escape his captivity. So to get back at the king, he slayed his two sons, and fashioned a goblet with jewels made from their eyes. Knocked up the king's daughter and blew that popsicle stand. Sure, it wasn't his wife yet exactly, but she was gonna be if he hadn't have turned her brothers into everyone's least favorite set of dinnerware. Take note of this one, folks. Don't do this one at home. Number six, Leif Erikson Day. Yes, the very same from SpongeBob SquarePants. Leif Erikson, the first European to land in North America. Hundreds of years before everyone's new, least favorite explorer, Christopher Columbus, discovered the Americas. A Viking man leads an expedition that honestly must have been just the worst. Sea travel just wasn't great back then. This really was a huge moment in history, one for the ages. But imagine breaking the news to his wife. Listen, honey, I know you've been hard at work cleaning and cooking and taking care of our children. And we both know I've been a great husband with all my drinking and fighting and all the mistresses I may or may not keep. So I just want you to know that I'm going to sail across the ocean for months and build a settlement in a completely different corner of the earth. Okay, bye. <laughs> See you later. Yeah, I'll write you. <laughs> Number five, Eric the Red. Probably the most infamous Viking who ever lived. And the father of Leif Erikson was Eric the Red. He earned this name most likely because of his gorgeous red hair and beard. Or it could be because he's the bloodthirsty Viking of your worst nightmares. When you think of the classic Viking, this is really what comes to mind. A drinking brute who could cleave a man in twain with a swing of his war axe. What I'm getting at is, getting bloodstains out of clothes is difficult today. But imagine what it was like back then. Yikes! Ladies, how many times has your husband come home from his blue collar job and just gotten himself into a mess? Also, take your boots off before you come into the house, dude. Come on, that's just not cool. Eric the Red most likely did the same, however, he was not covered in mustard from lunch or grease stains in the garage, but rather the fluids that can only come from separating body parts from unwilling donors. I get lightheaded just thinking about it, no thanks. Number four, strong, independent woman. Freydis was sister of Leif Erikson and daughter of Eric the Red. She had some strong blood in her. While not exactly Leif's wife, this story is just too messed up to not tell. This one goes to all the mothers out there. Remember your first child. Remember the joys of your first pregnancy. For some lucky women, this is an easy experience. But for others, well, for others, it's difficult to say the least. You might notice that your body is changing and all of a sudden, you're really craving food you haven't had in a long time. You may also feel a little queasy in the morning and many other little fun things that happen. Well, Freydis, the sister of Leif Erikson, went on that North American expedition with him whilst pregnant, which I can also imagine was just a beautiful pleasure cruise. However, her level of seasickness is not what's so messed up here, but rather that she had to defend herself by swinging a sword whilst very pregnant. That's a down bad woman right there. Number three, red flags. Dating can be fun. You get to meet new people and experience new things, mini golf, movies maybe even some nice restaurants. However, sometimes when we go on dates, they make better stories than experiences. Sometimes people give off red flags. People who put ketchup on pizza is a red flag for me. That's that's wrong, don't, don't do that. Meet Egel Skalgrimason. No, he didn't put ketchup on pizza, but he was a mean, no good, rotten man of a Viking but apparently was also an excellent poet. As the legends go, he got his first taste of blood when he was seven, when another young man crossed him. He then reached for his ax. You know what happens next. He grew up to be just the way you think Vikings grow up to be, and his violence carried on throughout his life. However, unlike most barbaric coastal raiders of the time, Eagle was also thought to be somewhat of a prolific writer, as his poems are considered to be some of the best from ye olde Scandinavia. Ladies, I don't have to tell you how toxic this is, right? This is a big red flag energy. Imagine getting in a brutal confrontation with him, and then he turns around and makes it into a compelling poem. Red flags all the way, no thanks. Number two, pay to win. Ragnar Lodbach isn't just a name that sounds like he could be a Dovahkiin from Skyrim. It's a name that struck fear into many Anglo and Franco kingdoms at the time. You never know when someone like Ragnar would show up in a boat with 30 other burly Vikings and just mess up your day royally. One royal that did not want his day being royally screwed up by Ragnar 
paid him to stop Vikinizing his village. Vikinizing is a word I'm gonna use. Which honestly is like asking water not to be wet. Yes, water is wet, the debate starts and ends there. Perhaps Ragnar was actually close on similarities to the Dovahkiin, as I find it's easier to stop using my dragon shout when gold comes my way. Well, if he had to be paid off like a goon for hire, you could imagine how sweet and caring he was to his wives. Yeah, probably not, no. Number one, Vikings. Look, this is another broad stroke, but guys, these are Vikings, and this was ye olde Europe. Yes, women did have more freedoms than others in Viking society, but it's it's just not a good time. And honestly, if you try looking through any lens of the present into the past, you're gonna find some things you don't like. Vikings were Vikings, and unfortunately for women at the time, that just meant they got the raw end of the deal, for a multitude of reasons. Whew. Glad we live in today, not then. Okay, number 10, location, location, location. So first off, let's begin at the very foundation as to why medieval castles were built in the first place. And the biggest hint lies in where they were built. From the 11th century onwards, medieval castles were built for a few reasons. One, to demonstrate wealth. Two, provide a place of defense and retreat. And thirdly, to defend important passageways and landways. Oh, and uh, it was a nice place to live. But specifically because of the last few reasons, where a castle was built, really, really mattered. Some were built by the sea to have a strong advantage over naval attacks, or they were built on hilltops just like you see in the movies. The more they could see, the better the chance they had of anticipating the enemy's attack. But even still, some castles took this idea to the extreme, such as Castle Monte Titano, which literally looks like it's about to fall off of a cliff any moment, or Perjemski Castle, which was built into the side of a cliff face and is only partially visible from the outside. This would definitely make it difficult for anyone to attack the fortress given the rough terrain, but still, like, how did they even build that? How did you even build it? I don't even know. Just the talent, pure talent. Number nine, helmeted cock. No. I'm not talking about what you think I'm talking about. Think about how much entertainment you consume on a daily basis. You're watching me right now, scrolling on TikTok, Instagram, movies, Netflix, whatever you wanna do. The desire for entertainment is strong in humanity, so medieval nobles found ways to insert the funnies into everything they could, even food. Helmeted cock was one such entertaining delicacy that delighted all of the guests behind the castle walls. It was essentially a rooster stitched to a pig and then roasted. Another game they used to play with their food was live frog and chicken. They would put live frogs into pie shells so that when someone cut into it, all these frogs would just ribbit about the dinner table. Hilarity! And then live chicken was significantly darker. They'd pluck a live chicken in boiling water in front of the guests, like in a jacuzzi, and when it passed out, they'd glaze it to look like it was cooked. Then they would lay it on the table, and when the chicken finally came to, it would bound up and down the table to the delight of the guests. This poor chicken who's like frantically being like, where the heck are my feathers? I'm naked! Just awful. Weird times. Weird, weird times. What else were they gonna do? Number eight, the art of dying. To see where I'm going with this, check out this pic. Why does he look so calm? He's literally being stabbed in the head and like the side and everywhere else. While in real life this wouldn't actually happen, you wouldn't be this calm if you were being killed, but this was the goal. People lived in a very pious society back in the medieval ages, and what with death looming around every corner with the Black Plague, you know, they developed a very unique idea about death called Ars Moriendi, the art of dying. The idea revolved around a good Christian death, that it should be planned and peaceful. I'm going to die on December 16th, blah, 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 whatever date. They didn't actually say that, but anyways. So as medieval people were lying on their deathbed in their castle, they were expected to receive it without despair or any kind of existential crisis. You had to take it honorably and if you didn't, it was looked down on, but then again, you were also dead, so what does that matter? But it was because of this belief that even in paintings depicting gore and death, the victim, who was stabbed in the head, always had like a calm expression, which is like, yeah, this is fine. It's a flesh wound. Number seven. A jester versus Netflix. As soon as I said jester, you pictured a tight wearing, colorful bard with a stupid hat. Probably not far off, but the nobles had to entertain themselves somehow as previously mentioned. The castle would play host to loads of minstrels, jugglers, and acrobats. Edward II, for instance, in 1306, had hundreds at his knighting celebration. But the original meaning of the jester was just simply a good storyteller. They would wander in on dark evenings and entertain the company with fancy tales, comedic and dramatic. But soon, jesters became employed full-time to kings and lords. Henry II had one called Roland the Musical Farter. Very name. I wonder what he did. Every Christmas, he would perform and earn a grant of the land, so they were paid pretty well. He had to be wise and quick-witted in order to maintain the love of their masters. However, if they went too far... 
off with her head. Tribule, the king of France's fool, once went too far and was sentenced to execution, but he got out of it when they allowed him to choose how he would die. He simply said, old age, and he was pardoned. Again, quick witted. Number six, gazing out of windows. Imagining a world where women are restricted from education, business, autonomy is thankfully getting harder and harder to do. But even without feminism, women still operated within the constraints of a patriarchal society in very important ways. It was their job to run the entire castle when the lord was away, for instance. They weren't just staring out windows, waiting to lower their hair for a handsome suitor. Medieval noblewomen, for instance, had the responsibility of running the household and enforcing it. Lords were often away on crusades. Crusades, war, court, or even just dead. So it was up to the ladies to run the estate, finances, and even to defend the castle against attack. Also, if the husband was dead, many women would choose not to remarry because you had more advantages being a widow than being married. You would essentially be treated as a man, especially with, in terms of property and things like that. Religion was also incredibly important, and one of the restrictions for women at the time was that they were forbidden from touching the altar. So in order to metaphorically dance around this, they donated their clothes to the church, which would eventually be worn by the clergymen, hence they would eventually touch the altar. A very clever way of getting around this rule, but more research needs to be done about women in the medieval ages, but this is kind of what it looked like. Number 5. Shotgun Weddings Behind the closed doors of the castle walls, love lives were pretty much what you would expect them to be. Really stinky, and also not about love. Marriage was politically motivated and there wasn't room for much love there. Women have women had essentially no say and both boys and girls could be married as soon as 12 to 14. However, compared to today, their ceremonies would be better compared to a shotgun wedding in Vegas than the ones we know. It would be completed in a matter of moments just by simply uttering consent. You could marry technically in the street or at dinner or at a pub or in bed after the deed is done. So, because things got so confusing by the 12th century, marriage got more complicated. It was declared a holy sacrament that must be observed by God. Observed being the key word. Not only did people actually have to see people saying I do, they had to see them do the deed. The bride was carried to the bed by the family and they would wait around until the act was complete. So you know what I mean. If you were lucky enough to live in a castle, you might have had bed curtains to shield the viewing, but they, they still heard everything that was going on. Number 4. The Mystery of Ludlow Castle Beyond weird weddings, war, and strange food performances, castles contain secrets behind their walls we may never know, such as the mystery of the White Lady of Ludlow Castle. In the 12th century, the castle was home to Marion de la Bruyere, and she had a secret. She was in love with a secret suitor with whom she would sneak into the castle each night. She would lower a rope in true Rapunzel fashion to bring her love to her. But little did she know that her mysterious love was setting a trap for her. One night he left the rope below so that more men could follow up behind him and take the castle. Bereft and betrayed, Marion stabbed her lover with his own sword. She then flung herself from the castle's walls and perished on the rocks below. To this day, people have stories of seeing a woman's white figure tumbling from the castle window, trapped in the desperate circumstances of her death. Number three, secret passageways. If I am ever. <laughs> Ever in my life, able to actually afford a house. We'll see. One of the ride or die requirements is a secret passageway or to a secret library. Like both. Both would be great, but a secret library is a must. And I will never tell anyone about it because how cool would it be if they found it themselves? Medieval castles were filled with secret passageways and alcoves designed to help facilitate escape should the need arise. In fact, it was kind of a requirement of fortifications to have one. The main secret entrance was called the postern. It was small, therefore easy to defend and protected by metal grates, as well as there were battlements above it. However, the entrance could be exploited if in the wrong hands. Say you have some double crossers behind your walls. They could help sneak in the enemy soldiers, such as the case of Corfe Castle during the Siege of 1645. An officer named Colonel Pittman helped aid enemy troops in through the postern, condemning the fate of the fort. Number 2. Where's the loo? <laughs> there are so many reasons to be thankful for modern day plumbing, but this reason above the rest. Because of plumbing, we don't need a gong farmer. What is a gong farmer? I'm not glad you asked. In castles, bathrooms were often called gongs or loos, and often overhung over the moat or onto the ground so that like whatever was happening would just 
drop below. There was a wooden board with a hole in it, you sat on it, did your business and got up. Simply straightforward. But sometimes the droppings fell into a cesspit like in Rochester Castle. The smell would rise up and though they didn't know about germs, they believed bad smells were unhealthy. So eventually, the pit had to be cleaned. Enter the gong farmer. This is a dirty job that even Mike Rowe would run from. They had to scoop out the stuff ferry it away and bury it. It was a dangerous job too and one poor fellow named Richard the Raker fell into one and drowned. Now that's a way to go. And last but not least, the Tower of London Zoo? The Tower of London has seen a lot of action since it was built by William the Conqueror in the 1070s. It has housed some of history's most famous political prisoners, but did you know that at one time it was kind of a zoo? From the 1200s to 1835, the tower housed an exotic assortment of wild animals. Lions, tigers, bears, oh my, but also elephants, monkeys, and polar bears. They were brought to the castle as gifts, and if you visit the attraction now, there are wire sculptures commemorating the beasts. In 1235, Henry III was given leopards, though most likely they were lions, but they were just called that, by the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II. And that's where it all began. The king decided to start a zoo at the tower, and that he did. A polar bear joined the exhibit in 1252, and then an African elephant in 1255. A special enclosure was built, but sadly the elephant died only a couple years later, which was sadly the fate of most of the animals. Except for the lions, they did pretty well. Kicking off the list at number 10, the first fossil. Before we get into some mysterious happenings and all that jazz, we have to talk about the very first Neanderthal skull that was discovered. This discovery came about back in 1829. The skull was found in a cave near Angus, Belgium. And at the time, they didn't even realize this was the skull of a Neanderthal. That knowledge came much later. Around 1856, quarry workers were ripping apart limestone in the Fidelfer Cave near the German city Dusseldorf. It was found in a place called Neanderthal. How fun is that? It was a small valley of the Dussel River. The skull was human, but it wasn't. This was game changing, literally. Number nine, home sweet home. Neanderthals lived thousands of years ago in cold environments such as England and Siberia, but they also lived in warm places as well. Warm woodlands in Spain and Italy, one or the other. So their home, their shelter rather, would vary in design. In order to survive the weather conditions, Neanderthals needed all hands on deck. Minerals, flora, fauna, fishing, hunting, it doesn't matter which season it is, you're hunting and supplying for your people. Neanderthals hunted down bison often, or reindeer, mammoths, antelopes, wolves, bears, even birds and hares. If you were an animal, you were being hunted and used in some way, shape, or form. Sorry, we're hungry. Neanderthals created tools to help them hunt. If they were in an area surrounded by flocks of birds, they crafted arrows. If they were near wild bison, they crafted spears. But they would just yuck. They would adapt their game. Number eight, craftsmen. Doesn't matter how far back you go, art will always be around in some way, shape, or literal form. Neanderthal craftsmen would carry with them a pouch. And in that pouch, it includes lithic flakes, sharp rock flakes to cut anything. Scrapers would be used to cut animal meat or carve wood. Pressure tools were also in there as well to sharpen the you know other tools I just mentioned. Just tools for tools in a big old pouch. Neanderthals would use hard rock napping and use striking techniques, and sometimes they would carve art. Yeah, Neanderthal carvings were discovered in Unicorn Cave over in Germany recently. Archaeologists found 50,000 year old deer bone with patterns carved into it. Either these guys were bored or they were expressing themselves. Eh, I say both. Number seven, extinction. Neanderthals emerged 400,000 years ago. And we've always thought that their extinction was caused by some sort of event, right? Some catastrophic wipeout. Very recently, a human tooth was discovered in a cave in southern France. The tooth is from 54,000 years ago. Now, this is important. We've always thought that Neanderthals went extinct 40,000 years ago when modern humans started rolling around. But this new discovery could mean that the two species may have coexisted at the same time. Did modern humans wipe out Neanderthals? Are Homo sapiens to blame for the extinction of Neanderthals? Ooh. Meanwhile, I'm over here like, hey, hit that thumbs up button. What's up, gang? Cheers for wiping out people and gangs and civilizations. I'm like, oh, I'm just asking you to subscribe, please. Number six, lunchtime. I'll have no idea what to eat for lunch from time to time, you know, but sometimes I'll straight up complain about it. Like I'll actually whine. I'll be like, oh, I don't know what to eat. How can I choose? Ooh, like what? I need to remind myself this is not a problem at all. Neanderthals would of course have to hunt in order to eat, but what if they couldn't hunt? Then what did they eat? Hart and Tartar hinted at their diet. They would eat mussels, dolphin, seal, tons of plants. This came to light after part of a seal's jaw was discovered in Vanguard Cave in Gibraltar. The jaw had man-made cut marks in it, marks from tools that I mentioned earlier. It's all coming together. See, we're starting to figure out Neanderthals as a unit. This is what we're here for. Number five, more art. 
Here's where we're at with Neanderthals and art. First of all, we don't have actual representational art yet, but we do have symbolism. That's pretty close, it's close enough for me. And just as fascinating, in my opinion. Especially when they look like this. Yeah, these are eagle talons. They're about 130,000 years old, and they were found in Krapina Neanderthal site in Croatia. Researchers believe they were part of a jewelry set, like earrings, or maybe it was part of a necklace or something like that. I couldn't even make this now with a YouTube tutorial. You know what I mean? Like, how impressive is this? That's definitely art also, not symbolism. That's like, this is like cosplay. This is done so well. This is hours and hours of work. Number four, speak. You ever see Planet of the Apes? Like the new one, not the old ones with Marky Mark Wahlberg out of breath all the time. The voice acting in the new ones and the motion capture with Andy Serkis, oh, it's just fascinating. Turns out they would sound way scarier in real life. Research done back in 2016 shows that macaques have a vocal tract capable of speaking. The lucky thing is they just don't have the brain power to make words happen. We figured that out. We kind of evolved and we started talking and a vocal box started to get stronger and stuff. But if monkeys were to talk, this is what they would sound like. Will you marry me? Will you marry me? <laughs> Imagine a macaque saying that to you, I would be like, no thank you, sorry sir. Yeah, Neanderthals probably sounded like this. That thing is so scary, I was fine before I heard this. I didn't want to know what they sounded like, but I couldn't help myself, so now you have to suffer along with me. We still have no idea what Neanderthal sounded like, of course, we need a preserved voice box to do so, but it's probably something around here, maybe a bit more human, which is, I think, scarier to me. Will you marry me? Maybe it's something like that. They for sure spoke to one another. The way they lived, their social lives, for sure vocal. Will you subscribe to our channel? <laughs> so scary. Number three, Pit of Bones. Pit of the Bones in Northern Spain. First of all, what a horrible nickname. I mean, I get it, but... Okay. Since 1976, well over 6,000 human fossils have been found. They found around 28 individual Neanderthals in total. You know what? I take that back. Pit of Bones is actually a great name. Really nails it. The skeletons date back to around 430,000 years ago. And in terms of facial features, these are for sure Neanderthals. DNA tests were also done. Neanderthal lineage confirmed. And a big old pile of bones. Haunting, but sweet. That's what history is. Bumblebee, haunting, but sweet. Maybe that's our new uh, catchphrase. Haunting, but sweet, no. Number two, medicine. So far, you can only imagine the various injuries Neanderthals would have. Hunting down a mammoth or a bison three times the size of you, for sure, you're gonna pull something at some point. Odds are you're gonna get a bruise. So what did Neanderthals do at this point? When they're down for the count, then what? How did they recover? Is that what the pile of bones are for? Ooh, I'm finally connecting it, that's so dark. How did Neanderthals live so long without a pharmacy? All that yelling, no halls? Neanderthals medical skills are pretty similar to what our ancestors did. Herbal remedies, baby, that's pretty much it. They manage fevers, but they manage fevers, but when the pain got so bad, chewing on a specific tree may have helped them tolerate the pain. 40,000 years before penicillin, Neanderthals were just literally chewing on aspirin. We love it. And finally, number one, human sacrifice. Archaeology is fascinating, but the deeper we dig into our earth, the more we find out about our haunting past. And our past is pretty shady. We don't want to know too much. It's like, oh, we used to do what? Cover that back up. Usually these findings are horrible. Not too long ago, we found the remains of a 3,000 year old skeleton in Greece. And they found this skeleton on the side of Mount Lycaon, which historians know is the site of animal sacrifice for Zeus. For Zeus, the in Zeus. Ancient writers mentioned this site and how human sacrifice was also at play here. And now thanks to technology, we can confirm that this is indeed the case. We scanned it and we're like, oh yeah, for sure. This is not an accident. The upper part of the skull was missing and the body was laid out on two lines of stones with stone slaps laid on their pelvis. We look at Greece, of course, as the birthplace of philosophy, democracy, and the 100 meter hurdles and all that jazz. But they also did some sacrifice in their early human days. And their time off, you know, when they weren't slamming weak Merlot. Science has allowed us to look all over the world too, not just Greece. Ancient Egyptians and Aztecs, sometimes after Mayan ball games way back in the day, the losing team would be sacrificed. That would suck. Game, good game, good game, good game, good game. Number 10, the switchblade comb. A leather jacket, smacking jukeboxes, and a switchblade knife. Nobody was cooler than the Fonz on Happy Days. Well, maybe your uncle. Everybody has a cool uncle. But something I just think is silly, or something a lot of men probably use today, or at least the super cool guys who have no idea what or who the Fonz is, the switchblade comb. Basically, it's the same thing as a switchblade, but instead of a small blade, you got something to comb your hair with. Because when you're a man, you have to look fresh and tough at the same time. Trust me, ladies, it's, it's how we operate. 
Gotta look tough, gotta look mean. And kick the jukebox, Hey. Number nine, the ball jacuzzi. I don't know about you guys, but there is nothing better than a nice hot tub. I'd like to say I spend a lot of time in hot tubs with cute girls. However, due to my financial situation, however, most of the hot tubbing that I've done has been at public pools where I shared a hot tub with older Italian and Greek men who I swear were still wearing sweaters, but that was just their hair. Speaking of hair and saggy skin, meet the Tescuzzi, a tiny hot tub for the Pisha deal and two matzo balls. Hey, I understand, your undercarriage has to stay clean and honestly, I would love one. Chris and I were talking about we want one, we might even share one. Who knows? Number eight, the all-in-one. All right, man, this one goes out to us. The manly men, the dads, the sons, the brothers. The men who work all day and night and still have time for their family. I appreciate you and I see you, brother. Wanna know why we have so much time, ladies? Well, that's because we've cut back on time in the shower with a very five-head invention. We call it body wash or face wash or shampoo because we use it for everything, three in one. Yes, that's right. If we buy a body wash product, that means it will be used all over our bodies. No time for L'Oreal Pantene or that purple shampoo with the kangaroo. We speed run shower so we can get back into doing the things that you ladies love, like not putting the toilet seat down. Number seven, king of the porcelain throne. Kings, I hear you. Life can be busy and the shower speed run is not the only product that we've invented. Here's another shout out to all my kings who take extra time while sitting upon the porcelain throne. I salute you. Yes, that's right. Besides doing the hygienic process of evacuating one's bowels, we take a mental health break in the bathroom. A time to check in, relax, take inventory, and take a breath of some not so fresh air. Especially if you ate Taco Bell the night before. Is it strange to sit there in that situation? Perhaps. But like any other guru, we need a space to feel our spirituality. Would Yoda be Yoda if he didn't meditate? Mmm, sit on the toilet, I will. Number six, the beard apron. This is just so smart, and I'm seriously considering buying one because this is the bane of my existence. Sometimes the lumberjack look is too much for me, and the closer I get to looking like Chris Farley, the better. I think I have a great motivational speaker impression. Maybe I'll show you guys one day. We'll see, I don't know. However, when shaving my beard, I have nowhere to go, and it's too cold in the winter to do it outside, so. That's why this is so smart. Basically, it's an apron that you post up like a hammock. So when you're shaving down those chiseled cheekbones of yours, all the little hairs fall into the apron. That way your GF can't yell at you because there's no mess to be made. Necessity truly is the mother of all invention. Number five, bacon products. Who doesn't love bacon, right? Bacon is delicious. Bacon is a delicious meat that can be enjoyed for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Personally, there was nothing like waking up on a Saturday morning as a kid to play some GameCube and eat bacon and eggs, my favorite. I was a tubby kid and I was easy to impress. However, while bacon may not be the king of the breakfast table, it is the bootleg flavor of fragrance and the non-food market. It seems every time there's a store, gift shop, or novelties being sold, a bacon flavored, scented, or themed product is there for men and it's not far behind. Because yes, we are tough and rugged, and we make because we're cowboys. So that also means we want breath mints that are artificially bacon flavored, right? No, we don't, they taste horrible, it's awful. No one wants that, nobody wants that. Number four, bath bomb. Call it genius marketing, crazy society, or people wasting money, but a lot of hygiene beauty products that women purchase, men do too. They just gotta repackage it and inject it with 300 cc's of testosterone because men. Take the hand grenade bath bomb for instance. Taking bath bomb to a whole other level. Yes, the one I saw while researching was very colorful and it looked like it had a fruity scent, but it was shaped like a hand grenade from the second world war. No way an adult man would fall for that, right? Pfft, no. Chris, you see my rubber ducky? Number three, the man bun. Honestly, I don't mind this trend. I actually think it looks good. Certainly better than the mullets of the 90s. There's no way you can tell me mullets look better than man buns. You just can't. The man buns are actually somewhat organized. Especially if dudes grow them out and maintain them. However, what is strange to me is the man bun add-on. Yeah, it's like a man bun extension. You just it's like a, like a clip-on. Basically, look like the guy who plays Wonderwall at every party for the low, low price of $19.99. I can't be dissing too much, though, because I wore a clip-on tie to the ninth grade. But the girls thought I was cute? I think? I think so. Number two, gendered products. 
Another broad stroke here, but when things get placed in the categories, there's always two colors that get used. Pink for girls, blue for boys. While I'm not sure whether colors are actually masculine or feminine themselves, it has been hardwired into most of us, that's just how it goes. Anything plastered in blue or male-like imagery, it's what's meant for men. I, however, as a kid, had an absolute five-head play. To protect my valuables from thieves and villains in the night, I always chose something that was girl-themed, pink, or something a boy wouldn't pick. As I thought, if presented with my stolen items, I could always identify them since only a boy would choose girly stuff. From my Nintendo DS to my notebooks and honestly everything in between. I, Hot Pink was in and Chetty made it work. I thought the plan was foolproof. I, I never really thought though what would happen if a girl took my stuff though. That, that, that didn't, I didn't really think that wouldn't work for that, would it? No, it wouldn't. Number one, wine in a can. This one is just so silly to me and for any wine connoisseurs out there, take this with a grain of salt. I'm no sommelier, but I enjoyed the odd glass of wine, even if it comes from a box. I always thought the wine glass was elegant, higher class, but that doesn't mean you have to be higher class to drink it, or be less masculine. Well, now there's wine in a can for men, because we can't have flimsy glasses, we'll break those glasses because we're so strong, oh yeah. Number 10, apple bobbing. Okay folks, time to paint a picture for you. I love doing this. It's a warm summer night. You're at the county fair. You've managed to eat enough fried food to feed a large family. And even more surprisingly, you fit into those blue jeans. They're tight. The sound of carnival games and people having fun pollutes the background. That's when you see her. She's tall, blonde, and is wearing a pair of cowboy boots. Yeehaw. She calls you over. There's an apple bobbing game. You've never bobbed for apples before, but to impress the pretty lady in cowboy boots, you go for it anyway. You fail, and now you're cold, wet, and ladyless. Yes, this fine American carnival game gets its roots from the Middle Ages. It's simple, fun, and no matter what time period you live in, sometimes it was even used as a form of dating, which is kind of weird, actually. Names were written on the apples, kind of like speed dating, and then you'd bob for them, and then you'd go off of whoever's name was on the apple. I I've done it before. I'm not very good at apple bobbing. And now I'm just cold, wet, and maidenless. Number nine, Kitty Bonfire. This is the worst. Yeah, I've talked a lot about a lot of naughty stuff in my time here as the king of the hive, but this one, it just sucks, dude. Look, we've all been bored before. I have too. Have we all done stupid things when we're bored? Yes. Remember Roman candles? You point them at each other, you shoot the fireworks at each other. Some of you done it. Don't lie to me. I know you did. Sure, that's just a part of growing up though. However, growing up in the Middle Ages, and more specifically in France, uh, they liked to have barbecues. Except it wasn't delicious mouth-watering ribs or chicken, it was cats. And it wasn't for eating, but just for entertainment. Yeah, just for a, a, a good old laugh. Uh, don't have time today, but I've got a great story about a stray cat. Maybe I'll, I'll use that for my first stand-up routine, we'll see. But regardless, I'm just trying to have fun in this one because it just makes me sad. Let's move on to the next one. Number eight, mob football. Football is the world sport. Name a country, they probably have a team in it. And Canada might even bring the cup home this year, boys and girls. Now that would be cool. However, uh, the billion dollar sport was nothing close to what it is today. Football has rules, regulations, and athletes performing at peak performance. Ronaldo was one heck of a player. In medieval times, there were no rules on how many players there could be. Sometimes it was even whole towns versus one another. The ball? <laughs> Not something you can find in the back of your favorite department store. It was an inflated pig bladder. Ugh. The only goal was to get it to the other side with any means necessary, which oftentimes meant it was going to get physical. A lot, a lot of beating and whatnot, a lot of hitting. Not very good, don't do that. I'll stick uh, not playing that sport, thanks. Number seven, public de-lifing. There were jails and dungeons in medieval times, sure, make no mistake of that. However, a lot of times sentencing for crimes would often lead you to losing your head, where a large sweaty man, such as myself, wearing a black cloth mask would take a very sharp axe, sword, or any other sharp utensil of war from the war cabinet and liberate your head from your shoulders. Thing is, some folks would come out to watch this, as this was apparently a form of entertainment. I mean, why not? I guess, sure. Sure, it's, it's friendly family fun. Bring the youngins, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa. Pack some sandwiches just to make sure, just make sure you stay out of the splash zone. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know why they did that. That was pretty common, that's weird. Number six, Wario shoes. Fashion. I'm not a fashion guy, and I don't claim to be. I don't have the cash flow for it. But one day, I swear, if I got the do-re-mi, it'll be leisure suits and Frank Sinatra every time I sit down to eat a meal. 
Gotta have those shoes to match that frank energy. Shoes that say, yes, I am moderately talented and handsome and have a great following, but I have some shady connections to the Italian mafia. <laughs> Villain energy. Well, what's more villainous than a pair of Wario shoes? Yes, some medieval shoes were big and pointy and sometimes floppy. It was a sign of wealth, class, prestige, and the calling card of a portly Mario doppelganger. Surely you might not even wear these bad boys outside, but that's because you trip and fall, and I wouldn't want to trip and fall out there. I feel like any injury back then is uh, not good for your health. A cut could kill you, you know, you don't want that. Number five, animals on trial. All right, look, this one just doesn't make any sense. Zero sense. Law and Order. Besides being a great TV show, some would say it's the best thing we've ever come up with. Actual Law and Order, not, not the show. Thank goodness the system is perfect and never fails anyone ever. Well, they used to put animals on trial. I'm gonna say that again. They used to put animals on trial. Not sure how that works though. When cross-examining the witness, at what point do you call this BS? When you realize there's a barnyard animal on trial for a crime, or when the witness response is moo or oink. Like what, you know, like I don't know, it's, it's just silly. Unless people in the dark ages could actually talk to animals, and we since lost that ability as people. Nah, I'm just kidding, that's just weird. Just don't do that, don't, don't put animals on trial, dude. Number four, consummation of the union. I know I couldn't. I just couldn't do it. This is a story just as old as time itself. You get married, Pope's happy, dad's happy with it, mom's happy, you got a blushing bride, what more do you need? That sounds great, right? Well, well, uh, things would be great, but you have to sign off on the marriage. Cross your T's, dot your I's, so to speak. Train going into the tunnel, the bedroom dance, the hanky panky. What bad marriages only do on birthdays and Hanukkah? Yeah, you know. Well, if that isn't depressing enough, how about having the family come and watch like they just subbed to yield the OnlyFans? No, not just your family, but religious nobles, respectable people in your community. And they're going to watch you do the deed. They're there to make sure the marriage is complete. I just, do you, do you cheer on? I don't know, like, that's just so weird. Number three, pale skin. Ladies, beauty, and the industry. Look, there's a lot of things that can bring you up, bring it down. The makeup industry can be kind of tough to wrap your head around. It's, it's crazy, I know that. And there's been some crazy ideas out there throughout history. I think Medieval Times takes the cake though. You start with hair. All right, so we're going for the George Costanza look. Balding or receding hairline, beautiful. No eyebrows and no eyelashes, oh, even better. If this look wasn't enough for you, now you gotta make your skin pale. Like really pale. And the only sure way to do that, ladies, is bloodletting, which I hate talking about every time it comes up. I hate it, dude. Time to bleed for beauty, ladies, and as if that's not already done already. You let some blood go and you feel a little lightheaded, but now you're finally ready for the ball. Look, the hair thing, it doesn't matter. It doesn't define anything. Wear it how you want. Please don't hurt me, Will Smith. But the blood thing? I just, I can't recommend that to anyone. Don't don't lose your blood for to, to go pale. I, oh, that's a horrible feeling. Number two, Dracula's grave. Vampires, they're real. Sadly though, they're not as gorgeous as the ones seen on the big screen in TV. Well, at least the people in medieval Europe thought they were real. So real that they used to take extra measures to make sure they could sleep soundly at night. Don't want your precious life juice sucked out of your neck. Unless it's for beauty, because that's normal. Do you have a family member who always checks to see if the oven is turned off before you leave the house? Well, this is kind of like that, except it was burials and driving wooden stakes to the hearts of cadavers. Just in case, you know? A little vampire insurance, if you will. We went from being afraid of those who fear garlic to wanting to date them. How the tables have turned. Number one, night, knighthood. As cool as it may seem in the movies or games, I personally wouldn't want to be a part of it. Knights were warriors of a noble class who started learning and training at a very young age. Squires and knighthood. A militaristic education ain't the worst thing ever, sure, but it's, it's the war and fighting itself that scares me. This is brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat we're talking about here. Swords and shields, bows and arrows, horseback warfare. Nothing can fully prepare you for that. Personally, the armor is not an issue. Not moving around in it, it's actually more flexible than you might think. Seriously, look, it is, it's more flexible. It's the idea of trying to take off the armor after returning from battle and running around and slaying the enemy all day. Yeah, chafing in metal cannot be fun, just saying. At number 10, shaming parades. If you've ever watched Game of Thrones, then you might be familiar with that scene where Cersei gets paraded through the streets of King's Landing while naked and while someone behind her rang a bell chanting, shame. Ding, 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 shame. 
You know what I mean? It's kind of a meme, but it's also based on a real medieval tradition called shaming parades. For years, people have loved shaming others. I think it's just human nature at this point. And obviously, back then, they didn't have any social media to use as their preferred method of ripping on someone, so they got creative very creative. Depending on what the accused did, their punishment would vary. But the one thing that stayed constant was them being paraded through the streets for everyone to watch. Specific punishments were given for specific crimes. For example, if a tavern owner served bad beer, then they would be paraded through the street and forced to drink their bad beer. If they were caught stealing a pig, then they would walk through the streets with a dead pig around their neck and a crown made of pig's feet. How regal. People would throw things like glass, rocks, and even dead cats at whoever was being paraded and it was quite the spectacle. Now would you rather experience this or being cancelled on social media? Let me know. At number 9, bloodletting. Back in the dark ages, medicine just wasn't the greatest. Clearly, I mean they had a plague that wiped out 50% of the population in Europe. Even their quote unquote doctors were overlapping jobs. Barbers were cutting hair, obviously, but they were also setting broken bones and bandaging wounds, so I'm not really sure I would trust that, but back then it was a case of you get what you get, so I don't think people were really complaining too much about their barber Joey down the street giving them a cast, you know? But other than the practice of patching wounds and whatnot, they were also practicing bloodletting back then, and it was a little much. Bloodletting was the practice of withdrawing blood in order to cure or prevent illnesses or diseases, so doctors would use things like leeches to suck up the blood of their patients, but they also used scarification methods to scrape away the skin to drain the blood, and others used lancets to slice open veins, sometimes including the jugular vein. I am so glad that we do not do this anymore because frankly, I would like my blood to stay inside my body, thank you. Now before we carry on talking about just how weird things were back in the dark ages, why not leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, maybe think about smashing that subscribe button as well to see more videos like this one. On number 8, day drinking. Day drinking is a thing. You know, when you're with the homies and you pour yourself a glass of sangria and take a walk around the neighborhood in the middle of the afternoon. Not saying I've ever done that. It's usually a once in a blue moon type of deal, but for people in the dark ages, day drinking was an everyday affair. Now, people back then weren't necessarily drinking at all hours of the day just to get plastered and stay plastered. It was actually for health reasons. You see, people tried to avoid drinking the water at all costs over fears of illness because the water just wasn't clean and wasn't safe to drink, so they turned to the next closest thing that they could drink and that just so happened to be alcohol. Back then it was common to drink large amounts of beer, cider or wine, and it was common to be drunk all of the time. Thank god we can safely drink water now because I don't think anyone could handle the hangover that came with all that heavy drinking. At number 7, no pleasure. The dark ages were heavily immersed in religion. In medieval Europe they took Christianity very seriously and people followed the church very closely. The mission of people back then was to live a good Christian life and to not commit any sins, but one of those sins was a little unfortunate when you look back on it. Back then any sexual acts that were meant for pleasure and not for procreation creation was considered a sin. That meant that sexy time was reserved for furthering the population and that's it. And if you did anything recreational, you would be getting a one way ticket to hell. Along those same lines, it was also believed that female domination was also a sin and so the woman could not get on top, or again, straight to hell with her. One saint, Francesca Romana, was so afraid of experiencing pleasure when she slept with her husband that she literally burned her lady bits with hot fat so that it would make the experience as miserable as possible. That sounds horrible. At number 6, cemetery fun. What types of things do you guys like to do for fun? Do you play video games or read or maybe you watch Netflix or YouTube? Huh? And where do you like to go for fun? Maybe the mall or to your friend's house? Well if you lived in the dark ages in Europe, you would go to the place that everyone goes for fun. The cemetery. Yep. You're gonna go kiki it up with the corpses and unfortunately they're not corpse husband, although corpse if you're watching hit me up. Thank you. Anyways, back in the dark ages, the cemetery was the place to be. It was considered to be the social hub of the community. Back then people held theater performances, elections, trials, and even set up businesses in the cemetery because the graveyard shops were exempt from taxes. There was quite a lot going on in the cemetery, but it was almost the equivalent of going to the mall. But I want you guys to tell me if you would ever be like the people in the dark ages and just go to the cemetery for fun. At number 5, an eye for an eye. 
When it came to the legal process in medieval Europe, things weren't always fair. I mean, they tried women for being witches and prosecuted animals for various crimes. Their punishments were sometimes swift and just, and other times, they weren't. People back then believed that when found guilty of a crime, there were worse punishments than losing a hand or something. As I mentioned a little earlier, they were quite fond of public humiliation, but they also believed in issuing fines and even kicking someone out of the community altogether. If someone was found guilty of a violent crime, then they would be subjected to punishment that would cause them pain as well, but not to teach them a lesson, but rather to brandish them so that they would be recognized as a person in the community who did that one thing to that one person. You know. Since since these people were very religious, they also had to make up with God for whatever crime they committed as well, so usually that would involve fasting and then it would be up to Sky Daddy to determine if further punishment was needed. At number 4, The King's Evil being a king or queen in the Dark Ages might seem like a pretty cool job, but I don't really think it was. With the rivalries these people had, they were at risk of being assassinated in one way or another, they had to worry about their bloodlines, and of course, the thing that everyone had to deal with illness. Some kings, to help out their people, were tasked with healing an illness called the king's evil. And you're probably wondering, well, these kings weren't doctors, how did they cure illness? And to that, I say, well, they touched it, of course. This whole thing started in the 11th century when Edward the Confessor became known for touching a person suffering from scrofula, aka the king's evil, and they cured them. People thought that this was a miracle and so for hundreds of years after that, English and French monarchs were tasked with touching the sick to cure them of this illness because the monarchs were believed to be an incarnation of the divine. At number 3, Toothworms. If you're one of those people who really hate going to the dentist, just be glad that you didn't have to go to the dentist during the dark ages because that was an absolute nightmare and a half. Not only do they not have any proper medication or anesthetics, but you could also get the worst diagnosis your dentist could ever give you, and that was a diagnosis of an infection of toothworms. They believed that people could be infected with toothworms that caused a tooth to decay and that pits and holes in the tooth were home to a worm that looked like a tiny eel. What's worse than the diagnosis, however, is the removal process. They didn't want to pull out the tooth that was supposedly infected with these tiny worms, so instead they used a more holistic approach. A method that they would use to rid the worm would be to take a candle made out of sheep's fat and various seeds, and then they would hold it as close to the tooth as possible so that the worm would run from the heat and fall into a little dish of water that was being held beneath the patient's mouth. That sounds like a horrible trip to the dentist, that's for sure. At number 2, Judging Tears In modern times, somehow we've come up with this idea that only girls are allowed to cry. I think that's pretty BS and it's healthy for everyone to express their emotions, and funnily enough, they believed the same thing back in the dark ages. Back then, everyone was expected to cry freely, but the strange part of all this is the fact that people judged how others cried. Their tears would be judged on quantity, duration of crying, and frequency as well. They took their tears pretty seriously. Obviously, when someone was crying because of some kind of loss, it was pretty much nothing, but if they saw someone else crying for a different or unexplained reason, this was believed to have been a different kind of tears called the gift of tears. They believed that this was a sign that someone was thinking of Jesus and his suffering, and that they were so overcome with emotion that they were moved to tears, and this was also considered a gift from God. As long as someone's crying wasn't too loud, they didn't cry too much, and it didn't disturb anyone, especially during a church service, they were just considered particularly devout. And finally, at number one, pee readings. This dark age tradition is probably one of the strangest ones I have ever heard, and you might come to think the same thing. In medieval England, people were known to get diagnosed based on their pee. Back then, they believed that the consistency, color, and taste of someone's pee could diagnose someone's ailments. They took this method of diagnosis so seriously that they published books for the wealthy so that they could do the practice at home, and these books included illustrations and color charts so that they could judge their own pee. According to their text, if your pee was white, then it was the ideal color and that meant everything was working properly. If it was wine colored, like blue or black, then that meant that something was very wrong. And if it was green, then you were basically on your last leg and you should probably get your will in order. Number 10, capture over choice. Consent is my favorite word. It really is, because it's important. But back in ancient times, 
wasn't really a word anyone really understood. Thousands of years ago, couples skipped right over dating and instead went from captured to married. In fact, it was this idea that kind of sparked the origin of the honeymoon. A bride would be captured from a tribe, the tribe would go looking for her, and the thief would hide her away until they stopped. If you have watched the Spartan video on Bumblebee, if you haven't, go check it out, then you may know that their marriage ceremony centered on this as well, kind of, sorta, of, but it was, but consent was involved. As a way of courting, the women would wrestle to demonstrate their physical prowess and vice versa. They would watch the men as well and they would kind of simultaneously be like, yep, you. Then the woman's head would be shorn, they would dress them as a boy, and then they would be placed in a dark room and then wait for their betrothed to capture them and take them away. So very confusing there. I don't really understand it. But anyways, let's move on. Number nine, love letters. So nice. Today, it's easy to send a saucy text and an explicit pic to your partner or fling, or a person you're just friends with, but you know. Or the person you've been seeing for like half a year, but they're not your BF or GF, like no. Anyways, the rules are up in the air. But back then, you had to wait with bated breath to receive a thought out letter from your lover, filled with poetry and extravagant flirtations and little drawings. There are love notes between Anne Boleyn and Henry VIII. Henry even drew little doodles of a man depicted in lovesick sorrows. Anne then wrote back with drawings showing her talking to the angel Gabriel, being like, oh yeah, I'm gonna get a son. The Tudor version of the emoji. One of their exchanges went, and I quote, If you remember my love and your prayers as strongly as I adore you, I shall scarcely be forgotten, for I am yours, Henry Rex forever. And then Anne's response was, Be daily prove you shall me find, to be to you both loving and kind. And then he cut her head off. How quickly the milk turned sour. But it was the way to play back then, and soon you'd have stacks of letters with declarations of love as you're heading to the chopping block with the guy beside you. Awful way to go. Awful way to go. Henry, you suck. Number eight, escort cards. Today, someone might ask you for you to give them your number so they can text you, you up at like 3 a.m. No, you're not, you're asleep because you have to work the next day. If you lived in the Victorian era, you may have dropped a calling card instead, or an escort card. Want to go on a date? Here's my card. It doesn't sound so romantic, but social calling cards didn't have your usual brick printing and beige background. Social calling cards were lavish, enticing, elegant, with bright colors and lush paper. If a man wanted to court a woman, he would hand her his calling card, which would not only include his name, but compliments to her. Kind of like a Valentine's Day card, but every day of the year. If a woman was the bee's knees and she was unmarried, she'd often return home with stacks of them. If she was particularly fond of one of them, she might take up the offer presented with the card, the offer of escorting a woman to and from a future social gathering. She would send her servant to deliver the news with her own calling card in response. This process was repeated several times and either amounted to something steady or flittered out. We all know what a ghosted text feels like, so I imagine this would be kind of the same. Number seven, knives. Huh? If someone ever hands you a knife outside of lending it to you to eat your lunch, be wary, they may be trying to court you. In some Nordic countries, some courtship rituals involved knives. In Finland, for example, when a girl came of age to start courting, her father would give her an empty sheath to wear. It would be attached to her girdle, and when a suitor liked her, he would put his knife in her sheath. <laughs> <laughs> if the girl was interested, she would keep it. If not, she would give it back. <laughs> Good old nonverbal communication. No. But also imagine putting a knife into the hand of someone you just denied. Ooh. If she kept it, this was also a signal to other suitors that she was taken and not interested in pursuing others. The idea of giving a woman a token of affection that she could use to signal her own interests is seen in many cultures such as... What's next? Number six, 
spoons. We talked about knives that fit their sheaths. Now let's talk about spoons. Spoons? Dating back all the way to 17th century Wales, suitors would give ornately carved love spoons. They would make it from a single piece of wood to show his affection to his intended. On the spoon, there would be engravings which would symbolize intention, i.e. an anchor for instance would mean I desire to settle down, and the vine would mean something like love grows. Rural peasants used wooden spoons to eat and prepare food, so carving spoons to use every day was a usual chore. The most beautiful spoons were kept therefore to keep as gifts, to give to those you loved or wanted to. The better the spoon, the finer the details, the finer the craftsman, the better the husband, which signaled to the love interest that they were reliable and skilled. The tradition is not specifically unique to Wales, in fact it happened in many Celtic countries. Number 5. Dating and Dangerous So fun fact, after the Victorian era, or and slash kinda during, going on dates was uh scandalous, like pretty kinda ooh. The term date is a relatively new term. It was coined just before the turn of the century. George Ad wrote in the Chicago Record about young women filling up the dates in their calendar with rendezvous with young men and that was in 1896. In the 1900s it took a little bit of adjusting. This therefore set the term kinda date as women going on dates. In the 1900s this took a little bit of adjusting. A woman out alone with a man without a chaperone at night and not a courtesan? How scandalous! As more and more women started doing it, people weren't sure how to react. Law enforcement even got involved because they would see a woman alone with a man and be like, she's a woman of the night and then they'd arrest her or they would be confused. But either way, in the eyes of the law, dating kind of became a crime. Women making a date seemed like they were pulling something else so sometimes it was illegal to date though other times it was like dude just Stop, we're trying to go get dinner. Leave us alone. Number four, the art of the fan. Ooh. Being entirely open about who you were pursuing could raise a lot of eyebrows and damage one's reputation. So nobles often had to code their advances behind the art of the fan, mostly women, actually all women. If you have ever seen Dangerous Liaisons, you may have noticed Glenn Close elegantly using her fan to seduce and manipulate gentlemen callers around her finger. And that really how it was. It was all a game only the cleverest suitors could decode. Carrying it in the right hand in front of your face? Follow me. Placing it on the left ear? I wish to get rid of you. With the handle to the lips? Kiss me. A society lady in the 18th century was expected to know how to elegantly handle and hold a fan. This also helped differentiate between social classes. So not only was it used to set up a secret meeting in the garden with your betrothed lover, it was also used to communicate gossip and information. Number 3. Classified Ads Today we have so many dating apps, it's dizzying. You can swipe left, you can swipe right for your dream bow, any which way you like, Hinge, Tinder, Bumble, is that all there is? Plenty of fish, I don't know. It may surprise you to learn that this wasn't the first time people tried it this way. Enter classified ads. Uh, or personalized ads. If you were desperate for love and knew your person was out there but you just hadn't run into them yet, you would make an ad. In 1722, a Bostonian took space in the New England Current to put out an ad for, and I quote, any young gentlewoman that is minded to dispose of herself in marriage to a well accomplished young widower and has five or six hundred pounds to secure to him by deed of gift, she may repair to the sign of the glass lanthorn in Steeple Square to find find all the encouragement she can reasonably desire." And unquote. It was written by a 16 year old Benjamin Franklin. Oh bless. Some would even put out ads that captured the attention of someone they saw in passing. Take for instance this 1748 printing calling for, and I quote, a lady genteelly dressed. This is to acquaint her that if she is disengaged and inclinable to marry a gentleman who was on that occasion is desirous of making honorable proposals. <laughs> so cute. And now we know that all those dating apps were just a matter of time. Number two, bedding ceremonies. Okay, so I can't, I can't, I can't think of anything I would like least in the world Ugh, than to have an entire room full of guests during one of the most private moments in anyone's life. 
especially my parents. Ugh. Now, first comes dating, or courting, as it were. Then comes marriage, slash, sometimes they would just skip over dating and just go right to an arranged marriage, especially if you were a noble. And then for a long time, comes your aunts, uncles, and parents into the bedding chamber to watch the consummation. Yay. A crowd of people would be there up until the very last second when the curtains were drawn, cheering you on. <laughs> Someone even like offer advice, like don't do that, do this. Some even stayed well past. For instance, on the wedding night of the young King Louis XIII and Anne of Austria, they had two nurses in attendance to make sure the ordeal went down. But this wasn't just in Europe, this also happened in China in the early 1900s. Number one, bundling. Probably one of the most awkward ceremonies ever to take place, As, except for that one. That's the worst. But this is specifically to do with before getting married. As we have gathered thus far, being young and in love, or just being in love in general, has never been too easy. Bundling was a way to make it easier, I guess. I don't know. This 17th century tradition involved having your beau invited over, the parents needed to prove it, of course, and then you were to spend the night sleeping next to each other bundled up to the neck or sometimes just the waist like in like a human sack and then you would sleep next to each other with a plank of wood in the middle. So romantic. The tradition was meant as a way to gauge chemistry between the two lovebirds. The two would get to know each other by talking and sleeping together only before engaging in marriage. If it didn't go well, then they wouldn't get married. If it did go well, so much so that they unwrapped each other like Christmas presents on Christmas morning, then they pretty much got married like as soon as possible. The tradition was pretty popular in Ireland, the rural United Kingdom, and the New England colonies from 16th century into the 18th, but a lot of Victorian ideals were completely against it. They were like, no, corset it up and no Love. Number 10, Hidden Beached Whale. Look closely at this 1641 landscape from Henrik van Anthusenen. This masterpiece here is titled View of Shevetigan Sands. Now, do you notice anything out of the ordinary? Anything weird about the 1600s beach day going on? Besides everyone wearing pants, obviously so hot. What is everybody looking at, right? Almost nothing. I feel like we're missing something in the photo. Like say maybe, I don't know, a beached whale? Turns out after hundreds and hundreds of years, hiding in the painting this entire time was a beached whale. 2014, this was breaking news in the art world. Now at some point after it had been completed, the work of art was painted over. Somebody's like, you know what? I don't like that whale. See ya, ancient Photoshop, gone. So for hundreds and hundreds of years, somebody was looking at this wondering what the meaning behind the photo is. It was a beached whale the whole time. It was haunting them the entire time. They never knew. Number nine, the old guitarist. Any Game of Thrones fans out there? Rewatching it right now, this has some White Walker vibes behind it for sure. The old guitarist is, well, it's exactly what you'd think. It's a painting of an old man hunched over with white hair and, well, he's playing the guitar. This would be a creepy painting regardless, but when Pablo Picasso was putting together this masterpiece back in the early 1900s, he had some tricks up his sleeve. In 1998, researchers used infrared on the painting. Yeah, national treasure style, how cool is that? And lo and behold, there was a hidden woman. A painting of a hidden woman, not a real life, that'd be scary. But there was a painting just staring back at you. How creepy is that? Another woman was painted underneath the elderly man. So because this paint was naturally fading, she's now becoming easier and easier to see as time goes on. So that's haunting, I guess. Let's move on. Number eight. Madam X. Shield your eyes, we got some scandalous spaghetti straps coming in hot. This painting was deemed too scandalous back in the day. And no, I'm not joking. Madam X, the portrait of Virginie Emilio Avenue Gautreaux was originally painted back in 1884 by John Singer Sargent. Now at first, John made the woman's strap sliding off her shoulder. A little artsy, a little whoopsie strap slip. But back then, this was a no-go. No, that was too scandalous for the upper class society around him. So John had to actually go back and repaint the strap back on. Backlash was still so strong after John had sold the painting that he was actually forced to move. Yeah, the guy left Paris because of spaghetti straps. What do we do? Number seven, The Lady in the Grass. A piece by Van Gogh, let's do it. Patch of Grass was a Van Gogh classic. It was done in 1887. Now upon first glance, the painting appears to be, well, nothing more than that. It's just a patch of grass. But in 2008, much later, Dutch researchers used an x-ray to take a deeper look into this grass and they found the portrait of a woman. 
Yeah, another woman just staring back. That's unnerving, and it turns out around one third of Van Gogh's artwork has old paintings underneath them. It's just taken so long for technology to now allow us to see the hidden picture. Literally, the hidden picture. Joris Deke of the Delft University of Technology, he has the coolest job ever. He peels back layers of paint digitally. That's like Spy Kids stuff right there. Currently, the painting is hanging in the Dutch Eastern city, Aturlo, in the Kroller Mueller Museum. So if you ever go there and take a look at this masterpiece, just know there's a woman looking back at you as you look. Cool. Number six, Mona Lisa. All right, another woman. This one a little more popular. The 15th century masterpiece from, again, Da Vinci. Let's talk scandals. There's already been hundreds of theories surrounding this painting, like perhaps, you know, she could have been pregnant, given her stance and the veil over her shoulders. Sure, it checks out, I guess. But back in 2011, a clue was found in the painting. Yeah, a clue, like national treasure. I love these painting clues that we're now finding. Silvano Vincetti supposedly found letters and numbers painted into her eyes. Teeny tiny numbers and letters, which is terrifying. I was at my desk earlier and my forehead was touching the screen. I was looking so hard, I had to find it. The L over her right eye means Leonardo, and in the other eye, there is a 72. So we believe so far that this relates to Christianity and Judaism. Seven, the creation of the world, and two, the duality of men and women. Now, meanwhile, I'm over here drawing, you know, those cool S's, thinking that I'm the shit. Nothing, not even close to this level. Artists are insane. Number five. Cafe Terrace at Night. Upon first glance, you can tell this is a piece done by the fabulous Vincent Van Gogh. The blue tones, the streaks. I mean, I myself recently did the Van Gogh experience downtown Toronto, and it was mesmerizing. I have a few pints, go look at walls move around. That's good, I guess. While his 1888 painting, Cafe Terrace at Night, looks like a quiet late night summer dream, there's something sinister really going on. Now, I'm not a Van Gogh expert myself by any means, but Jared Baxter, definitely is. And back in 2015, Jared brought forth this idea that Cafe Terrace at Night was really Van Gogh's version of The Last Supper. And it checks out. The figure in the center with the long hair, the 12 surrounding individuals, one of which is slipping into darkness. I don't know. It all makes sense now. Can't unsee it. Jared Baxter also believes there are hidden crucifixes in this painting. So that's, that's fun. Keep your eyes peeled, I guess. If you're doing Where's Waldo, Amp it up a bit. Number four, Bill Clinton. We've all heard that clip downloading music growing up. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Maybe that's in this painting. If you listen closely, you can hear it. Back in 2006, former US President Bill Clinton showed off this beautiful portrait of himself done by the incredible artist John Nelson Shanks. Now, as far as portraits go, this is beautiful. The art is beautiful, yada, yada, yada. But that pose, I mean, I don't know. Something's off about this pose, right? Well, that's because the shadow on the left side of the portrait is meant to represent Monica Lewinsky. Yeah, we knew it. That's, that's that voice in my head, that lime wire voice kicking in. We felt her somewhere in here, you know what I mean? The artist himself, again, John Nelson Shanks, confirmed that this was true. He used the dress shape as symbolism surrounding the scandal. Imagine that, imagine your side chick just haunting you forever in that painting. Ooh. Number three, the anguished man. I mean, first of all, aside from its dark history, who would be able to look at this painting? This is, I don't want this on my wall at all. Imagine this in your place, that's like from The Conjuring. That's terrifying to look at. The anguished man is a painting with thick, rich, bloody history. It's said to be haunted by the spirit of the artist who created it, which is fun. The artist apparently mixed their own blood into the paint while they were working away. So that's must have been a Ryerson folk right there. The painting has been passed down through generations of the artist's family, but each owner has reported strange occurrences while in possession of the haunting piece. Fair, obviously, of course you're gonna get haunted. Look at this thing. Some have claimed to hear whispers and moaning coming from the painting late at night, which is the funniest thing and also the scariest thing I could ever imagine. Imagine a moaning painting, trying to get a snack out of the fridge. Mm. Like, Ew, shut up, that's so gross, put it on the floor. Would you spend the night with this painting on your wall, next to you, in the other room, somewhere in your presence? I don't think I could do it. Comment down below, would you want this painting? Do you like it? I don't know, are you an artist, are you a painter? Tell me about your work. Send me your work, send me a painting, I'll put it up, I don't care. Just don't make it haunted or made of your own blood, we're good. Number two, portrait of Bernardo de Galvez. Bernardo de Galvez, he was a nobleman and a military leader who played a significant role in the American Revolution. He was widely regarded as a hero for his efforts to aid the American colonies in their fight against British rule. Now, some believe that there is a curse attached to his portrait. Of course, or else I wouldn't put it in the list, that'd be kind of boring. According to this legend, anybody who looks directly into the eyes of Bernardo's portrait, right there, that one right there, will suffer a terrible, terrible fate. 
So don't look, I guess. Just like, click like, subscribe, but don't look. That's how we do it. The curse was born during the Spanish-American War when American soldiers apparently looted Galvez's home in Louisiana. They took his portrait as a trophy. Again, how to get cursed 101. That's what you do. Since then, several people have come into possession of the portrait or stared deep into the portrait's eyes, like I have numerous times, and they experienced misfortune. So. Who knows? That's awesome. I'm glad I whipped together this list. Sorry, editors, you have to look at that photo. One man inherited the portrait from his grandfather and he hung it in his home. Now, not long after that, he lost his job and his wife left him. That's it, a double no-no. Another tale involved a museum curator who displayed the painting and then shortly after he suffered a heart attack. I mean, probably by just looking at it, that would be my guess, but who knows? Could be some cursed artifact history behind it. Even those who have seen photographs of the portrait claim to feel uneasy or experience strange occurrences afterwards. Yeah, that one right there, that photo. That's the one they're talking about. Number one, erase de Kooning. We have to finish with a nice funny one because it's my favorite art thing ever. I was so excited to talk about this one. This drawing, or erasing rather, was done by the one and only Robert Ruschenberg. Now, Robert wanted to explore whether or not a piece of art could be created by removing marking rather than by adding them. Yeah, sure, try this on your art teacher next time. Step one here was honestly kind of hilarious. First, Robert had to ask his very successful friend, fellow Dutch artist, William de Kooning, for one of his brand new beautiful drawings and Robert well he just erased it all of it pretty much 97% of it gone pretty much the entire thing after erasing his art Robert then added a frame put it up and then called it art what a weird move what a weird play some loved it some were like ah oh, yes this is new this is art this is it while others called the act pure vandalism which I gotta be honest I'm leaning more towards that one here 1953 this changed the game de Kooning's involvement also didn't help they're like why did you give it to him did you not know he was gonna erase it he's like no I did I don't know scandals art scandals who knew all right so you guys know my drill so let's start off with the information most people may know a little bit more about already such as dowries which is a nice way for for fathers to say, I will literally pay your family to get this chick out of my house. The arrangement of marriage was done by the bride and groom's parents. Royal or noblemen were sometimes able to choose their bride, but marriage back then was not based on love for the nobility. They were political arrangements. Husbands and wives were generally strangers until they first met, and if love was ever involved, it came after the couple had been married. But even if it didn't, most just sort of settled into a form of friendship or companionship or or just living with each other. The arrangement of marriage was based on monetary worth. Noble girls equal fatter stacks. Meanwhile, peasant dowries didn't really happen often, and when they did, they were paid in utilitarian means. The family of a girl who was to be married would give a dowry to the family of the boy she was to marry. After the marriage was arranged, the wedding notice was posted up on the doors of the church, and the notice was put up to ensure that there were no grounds for prohibiting the marriage by stating who was to be married and if anyone knew any reasons why they could not. But more on that in a little bit. Now, as mentioned, peasants were able to marry for love, but why make that choice? There was no marital benefits back then, because it's marriage or burn and damnation. Throughout the Middle Ages, the church essentially presented women with two life options in order to escape the sin of Eve. You could become celibate, which ultimately was the preferred choice, or to become married and mothers. Um, you don't bathe, there's feces everywhere, there's the plague, and a man could just kill you tomorrow for rejecting him, and you want to add kids to that equation? When there's no medicine either? Pass. Hard, hard pass. Nunneries were literal havens for these single women, because sure, you could be celibate and still live in town being a spinner or whatever, but again, you run the risk of some dude just jumping you and the courts blaming you for it and then doing something whack like cutting your nose off for it. Nunneries were female only. They kept things clean and locked up, so women could just try and have an ounce of peace in an era where existence was just to breed or feel bad about yourself. According to Host and CS, once a girl was physically ready to consummate, aka she met Aunt Flo, she was ready for marriage. However, since puberty came earlier for females than males, they could marry at a younger age. So, for peasants who were genuinely interested in marriage out of love, something that could only be done consensually on both sides, they were eligible once they'd hit their respective puberties and were able to wed. No parental consent required, which is the next on the list. As people lived short lives in the middle age period, parents of nobility often made arrangements early on and a few months old baby could be betrothed to another few month old baby and then raised in their respective royal nurseries until they hit 
hit that jolly old consummation age in their teens. Think Sleeping Beauty being promised to the prince in the Disney movie. Peasants and commoners, however, were able to marry as they wished, and parental consent wasn't even required. It was like this for centuries. But there's always those folks who didn't like when two separate religions mixed, and there's always those who tried to take advantage of the easy I do policy. So good things never last. And it didn't. When this law finally changed in England in the 18th century, the old rules still applied in Scotland, making towns just over the border, such as Gretna Green, a destination for English couples defying their family and wanting to marry without their consent. A brief personal story for you guys. So my mother is a traveler and decided to visit the famous Gretna Green town and wedding site, where the tradition of Gretna Green marriages still lives today. My mother was taking photos and reading history plaques when she got taken aside by her tour guide. A couple whose family wasn't supportive of their relationship, just like the couples of the past, had shown up and decided to marry spontaneously in the traditional way. They had chosen Gretna Green for its historical significance to their unsupported love, and they needed two witnesses. The tour guide could act as one witness, but they needed a second. So my mother stood as a witness for a young couple who had just traveled to the border to marry at Gretna Green alone, experiencing the same pilgrimage thousands of couples had done in history. So on the topic of witnesses, how did that get started? Up next is witness schmittness. In the Middle Ages, the household was headed by a husband and his wife was the center of the family life and economic productivity. As John Wellis said in 1486, more things are necessary for a household than four naked thighs. And he used this retort upon hearing that his alleged betrothed, Alice Billingham, had publicly declared they were married. Instead of saying it straight, John was chastising Alice for suggesting they could legitimize their romantic relationship without the necessary social status and financial stability, not just intercourse. Alice, however, goes, nah, 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 bro, I got the receipts, which were her witnesses to the fact that John had asked her to be his wife on the Feast of St. Valentine's that same year, which historically, yes, has always been a romance hallmark holiday. Asking her for her hand so that she could be his Valentine forever. These two contrasting stories, however, give us a peephole into the tension between the expectation of love versus intercourse, and then the making of a good and economically fortuitous marriage in the Middle Ages. Alice says, you proposed to me with love, therefore that is our marriage basis. John says, I may have said I loved you, but I won't make a wife out of a... Well, you get it. So while God was the ultimate witness, that's why couples could just say stuff like, be mine forever and become legally married. It's nice and all, but it was highly recommended to have witnesses to avoid uncertainty like the Alice and John situation. Because they didn't just sign your wedding doc back then, they stopped your husband from wandering off. I've done a lot of talk on the ins and outs of marriage, but how about kiss to be kissed, the medieval wedding ceremony itself? So there was some errands to run leading up to the big day. First of all, Long before the actual wedding, bands were called, which were literally three Sundays leading up, someone stands outside the church and hollers that your wedding day is coming up. It's done so that people can come find out about the celebration and come along to the wedding, but also those who had objections had the opportunity to voice them. They also put up signs on the church door with information, so if you're out just buying turnips one day and saw your husband's name and face on a poster, you could go up to the medieval lost and found and say, hey, yo, this one one's mine. Wedding's off. A wedding ceremony could not be held on a Catholic holiday or on Sundays. A couple could not be married during a time of fasting. They can't be married by someone who had killed someone else. So make sure you got all those things written down to avoid. When weddings started to occur at churches, they were done at the front doors. Nobles married with big parades and elaborate garbs, while peasants sort of kicked it in whatever they had. The couple would exchange vows, usually some Jesus-y stuff, and the priests asked one last time if anybody's got any beef with these two getting hitched. After that, the groom presented his bride with a wedding ring, blessed by the priest, and the ring was placed on each finger of the bride before landing on the ring finger and amen, the ring stays there. Then the procession goes into the church, a special mass began and people prayed for the couple and their future offspring. After the mass, the priest kissed the groom on both cheeks and finally the groom would kiss the bride. But sometimes you can say I do and have a whole ceremony and still have to prove it. In the middle ages, getting married was easy for Christians living in Western Europe. According to the church, which created and enforced marriage law, couples didn't need permission of their families or priests to officiate until towards the end of the 18th century. And though the church controlled or tried to control marriage, couples didn't need to marry in a church until the 18th century. So medieval legal records show people getting married on the road, down at the 
pub, at a friend's house, in bed, really anywhere. All that was required for a valid binding marriage was the consent of the two people involved. So, while tying the knot can take a matter of moments, proving you were married is a different story. The vast majority of marriage cases that came up before the courts were to enforce or prove that a marriage had been taken place in the first place. And marriage mix-ups bothered the clergy since, after much debate, theologians decided in the 12th century that marriage was a holy sacrament. The union of man and woman in marriage and intercourse represented the union of Christ in the church, and this was hardly symbolism to be taken lightly now. So they wrote up some laws and dished them out. The statutes issued by the English church in 1217 to 1219 include warnings such as no man should place a ring of reeds or another material, vile or precious, on the young woman's hands in jest, so that he might more easily fornicate with them. Lest he thinks himself to be joking, he pledge himself to the burden of matrimony. Another thing in those statutes was hold that peace. Not your pee though, I know it sounded similar, but you can do that on the streets anywhere. It's medieval times. Beautiful. Anywho, the bonds I mentioned earlier were introduced as part of the 1215 changes to try and flush out any impediments before a marriage took place. This could be someone is already married, or she's not a virgin or he's wanted for killing someone. There is range. Nevertheless, until the Reformation, there was no speak now or forever hold your peace. In the Middle Ages, problems discovered or revealed after marriage could have an enormous impact still. For example, Joan of Kent, who's remembered as Edward the Black Prince's wife and the mother of the future King Richard II, was married in her early teens. It was a whole Diana level spectacle with full publicity, a church service, her new boo was an aristocrat. But after about eight years of marriage, this marriage was overturned in the papal court and she was returned to a knight she had secretly married without her family's knowledge or approval when she was 12. Imagine that, spend eight years with a dude only to be shipped back to some idiot I said I love you to when you were 12. If that still happened nowadays, we'd all be locked in with our first crushes. Take a minute please and soak that horrible thought in. Anyways, it's difficult to know how many medieval people married for love or found love in their arranged marriage. There was certainly a distinction between free consent to marry and having a completely free choice. Now circling back to my earlier point where I explained the wedding day. How about the wedding night? Not a moment alone is next. Alright y'all have officially tied the knot and locked lips for the first time. You did some praying, now it's time for a meal. Pretty normal stuff that lines up with nowadays. The peasant couple celebrated with their friends and family, drinking bridal ale for this special occasion and eating a meal traditionally made up of dishes brought by the wedding guests to help feed the community. That's right y'all, like a trailer park wedding, medieval receptions were potlucks. After the reception, a peasant couple may dance and enjoy their night, but a royal couple is ushered to the chamber to consummate the marriage in bed ASAP. The priest, the clergy, parents, really whoever wanted in on the action would come into the room, kick their feet up, and have some popcorn and tell the couple give us a show here. The bride needed to be a virgin at the time too, which had to be proven by blood being on the bed sheets. If there wasn't any, the whole wedding could be undone on the spot, which actually would be really hard for those women who don't bleed their first times. They they do exist. And of course, because there isn't those enough people in the room while your cherry's getting popped as is, a medieval wedding tradition allowed unmarried guests from the procession to also follow royal newlyweds into the room and take turns throwing the bride and groom stockings at them. Whoever managed to make a direct hit would presumably get married soon. Yeah, this is where the bouquet toss comes from. Then someone has to go retrieve it off the naked sweaty couple so someone else can have a throw. Truly a magical time of wedding traditions. Imposed witnesses, parental consent, church weddings. Yes, it was because of the confusing I do issue and a bunch of others I've listed, but it was also because of kidnap. So, over the last 20 years, historians have increasingly problematized consent we've heard of in the past, warning us not to project modern understanding of consent onto that medieval canon law. Today, consent is is defined by what is present instead of what is absent. Yes means yes, instead of no means no. In medieval times, the gap between coercion and consent was essentially a hairline. Women didn't have many legal options to deal with very persuasive or dangerous men who demanded their hand and would stop at nothing to achieve it. And consequently, the women often agreed to marry them for fear of their life. Because stopping at nothing often led to being captured. And with women being property, if said captor managed to return home and take the woman against her will before a brother, father, knight, whoever can do something about it, she becomes his property. These abductions then regularly end in marriage 
because of the damage of the deflowering caused to the victim's reputation. She'd never be wanted by anyone else, and so the POS who can't understand the word no wins. To delineate between consent and coercion, canon laws dropped in the 1200s stated that the degree of pressure applied on an individual could not sway a constant man or woman, meaning that neither family members, romantic partner, a stranger, anyone could exert pressure on an individual to force their consent. However, the degree to which force is interpreted and is defined by each city or community, some communities stay stuck in old ways. And last but never the least is apparently you can be too into your wife. So, marriage aside from being a means of property exchange was also used by the church to regulate adult activities and carnal desires of the everyday person. Because any intercourse outside of marriage was a universal sin, but intercourse in marriage is only acceptable for procreation. Which means the church is trying to peddle that a good intimacy relationship was beneficial to your marriage, but neither desire nor pleasure should be involved or play a role in it. Because that's physically possible. They took this serious too, man. Like Thomas Aquinas warned that a man who slept with his wife solely for pleasure was treating her like a lady of the night. And St. Jerome stated in the 4th century that a man who is too passionately in love with his wife is an adulterer. This is a sentiment which remained pre prevalent up until the end of the 16th century. Not only was the purpose of intercourse within marriage made abundantly clear by the church, and still is, but there were many rules and regulations pertaining to the act itself. Like when the activity between the husband or wife was or wasn't permitted. That would be like a feast or fast day, Sundays, menstruation or pregnancy, while breastfeeding, and for 40 days after childbirth, also holidays, and holy days. This meant that on average, most married couples could illegally have intercourse less than once a week. Negative one time a week, you guys. But at least we had champs like Albert the Great who would throw ladies the proverbial bone every now and then. He defended women's carnal desires during pregnancy actually in a document, claiming that the fetus stimulated desire in women. A woman never desires relations so much as she does when she is pregnant. Medicine is most needed in the time of greatest illness. That's a hell of a sentence. A lot to unpack there, so let's just leave it as medieval marriage suck. Kicking off the list at number 10, dark dining. I don't know about you, but I can't eat in the dark. I need to see every single bite that I'm eating, okay? Call me crazy. Part of me wants to go to a restaurant where you can't see anything, but I know that I won't make it all the way through. I can't do it. I like. I have a thing, I have to just, I'm not blindly, what if it's not cooked, I don't know. Back in the Victorian era, dining in complete darkness wasn't just a date night, it was actually the best way to digest, or so they thought. That's why many Victorian era homes had their dining rooms set up in their basement. How random is that? Oh, do you guys have poker nights down here? Nah, just brunch, kill the light. <laughs> what, how do you like your eggs? Turn off the light, <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> Number nine, saved by the bell. I'm sure you've heard about this at some point, but allow me to go into grim detail. In the late 1700s, cholera, bacterial infections, everything bad, you name it, it was all spreading. Not an ideal time to be alive. Many were biting the bullet at this time, of course being gravely ill, but with this came a dark trend. The safety coffin. Yeah, we got a safety, we had the safety dance, now we got the safety coffin, here we go. These coffins, I mean, God forbid you were buried alive, these safety coffins would allow the dead to rise again and exit said coffin. A lot of these coffins have extra comfort on the inside and of course, a wire. This wire ran through the coffin, through the ground and attached to a bell on the outside. So if a passerby or heard it, one, that would be so scary, but if they heard it, they would know something's up and they would help them out. Folks would get creative with their safety coffins. For example, a man named Robert Robinson from Manchester, he passed in 1791, but he instructed his family and watchmen to open the special door on his casket, revealing a layer of glass. Now, if anybody were to see condensation, he could then be removed. Patent number 81,437. It was actually granted to Franz Vester in 1868. It was an approved burial case, a real patent. This was a real coffin. This is crazy. This one had an air inlet, a ladder, and a bell. All three, there you go. The description of the patent says, if too weak to ascend by the ladder, he could ring the bell, giving the desired alarm for help, and thus save himself from premature death by being buried alive. Nice. You thought you died. Psych, climb this ladder. There you go. Good luck getting out. Now you're in an escape room. Enjoy. You only get two hints. Like a little walkie talkie. Hey, uh, how do I get out of the coffin in room B? Number eight, no air. Now that song's gonna be stuck in your head. Jordan Sparks, a classic. Since we're on the topic of safety coffins, I had to include one more. Maybe two more, I'll never tell. This one is fascinating. The science involved here was honestly impressive. 
There was the classic wire and bell method, but the more sick people got, the more creative they had to become. Like for example, patent number 268,693, John Krishbaum's device for indicating life in buried persons. Yeah, an 1882 classic, we love this. We got the iPod Nano, they got the device o life. Nice. Upon first glance, you may think this is some type of medieval punishment, whatever, but really this device detects movement whilst providing much needed air. Now you obviously can't have a hole in the ground or else rats will make your real demise much worse than suffocating, right? So John's device here, as per the disclosure details, is that if the person buried should come to life, a motion of his hands will turn the branches of the T-shaped pipe upon or near which his hands are placed. A marked scale on the side of the top indicates movement of the T and air will then pass come down the pipe. Once sufficient time has passed to assure the person is dead, the device can be removed. Yeah, imagine waking up with this in your hands. I wouldn't be calm enough to turn it and then breathe in a passive amount of air. No way, there's nothing passive about waking up in a coffin. Number seven, bad hair day. Okay, you want it messed up? Let's do messed up. Hope you're not eating any food right now, especially not eating in the dark. Two red flags. Okay, the Liverpool Daily Post back in 1869 had readers invested on this fateful day. Right on the cover it read, a 30 year old passed away in the village of Lincolnshire. Now at the time, that's not far off from average life expectancy in the 1800s. But this case was odd. Everyone wanted to read about this. This case was noteworthy. It was important that folks understood what took this young lady's life. Doctors asked the family if they can carry out a post-mortem and lo and behold, they found a two pound solid chunk of hair sitting in her stomach. Two pounds. That's what happened. That's how she met her fate. That's horrible. This ball of hair caused an ulceration of the stomach and ultimately caused her death. The woman's sister did note that over the last dozen years or so, she had casually been eating her own hair. So at this time I say, if you know anybody eating hair, send them this link. It's not a good idea. Cut that out. Stop doing that. Number six, the Great Famine. Weird time to talk about a famine after the hair incident, but okay, here we go. Back in 1845, a potato crop that a lot of the Irish population relied on was no longer available. This was huge. This is bad history right here. A group of microorganisms wiped them all out and in result, around 1 million folks died or had to leave. It was draconian law at this point and British ruling that made the exported food hard to reach people. This famine led to Irish independence and anti-union movements. Historical, definitely. Messed up? Absolutely. Number five, Queen Victoria's name change. Every year on May 2-4, we set off fireworks, then we have way too many hot dogs. It's the best. We call it Victoria Day, right? It's for sure called Victoria Day, right? Well, back in 1819, Victoria was christened in an almost private ceremony. It was small, obviously. Victoria's uncle only let a few people attend. Like I mentioned in part one, she had an isolated childhood with the whole Kensington system. That was no way to live. But even the day she was christened, trouble awaited. Her name was Alexandrina Victoria, and at the time, the name Victoria was not regal. It was a French origin, almost an odd name to have at the time, so she was immediately advised to change her name to something more traditional. But as our calendars can definitely confirm, she said, nope, I'm good. Victoria Day. Yeah, it's definitely Victoria Day. Number four, tattoos. I only have the one tattoo, but I've always wanted more. It's not so good with needles, you know? I got my eyebrow pierced and I fainted. It's a fun fact, I have a little scar there. Not great with needles. Some of the designs are so beautiful on tattoos, the amount of pain you all sit through, I'm impressed, honestly, mad respect. The tattoo craze really took off once Queen Victoria's son, the Prince of Wales, he went and visited Jerusalem. And of course he saw copious amounts of body art and was inspired. Inspired, we'll say, yeah. So upon his return, he was all about ink at this point. And the Prince of Wales, well if he has a sleeve, well then maybe I can have a sleeve, right? What's going on? It wasn't a sleeve, really. It was a cross. The prince got a tattoo of a cross in homage to the Crusades. So if you're gonna try and convince your parents to let you get a tattoo, just, you know, tell them the Prince of Wales did, right? You're just trying to be a royal. Number three, gym day. Believe it or not, there were around 200 gyms across Europe during Victorian times. Yeah, just like six good lives. So you're like, what? What's this about? Even Victorian dudes skip leg day. How great is that? Okay, it's not just you. These gyms weren't bright, they weren't open, they weren't well ventilated, they weren't motivating, and definitely not safe. None of those, definitely not. No, Victorian gyms were reserved for the upper class, obviously. Grab your pocket watch and blazer, Ezekiel. We're doing squats today. These machines also were not ideal. They were designed as antiques first rather than their purpose. Also, half of these look like saw traps. Like, are you kidding me? No way I'd bend my arm around any of these devices. No way. All those wooden wheels? No. I'll stay weak and brittle. Thank you. Number two, ghost photography. 
how to look back. I don't like talking about ghosts. As if the reanimated corpses coming back to life while they were ringing a bell wasn't scary enough. Yeah, let's talk about 1800s ghost photography. The camera was a hot new invention at this time, so tales of ghosts and spirits were now easily believed. Yeah, obviously, when you have a photo of a see-through woman, you're like, I, that must be, that's pretty terrifying. A big name in the ghost game was a man named William Thomas Stead. He was born in 1849 and Stead was the son of a Congregationalist minister and at the age of 22 he was appointed as editor of Northern Echo, which was a regional newspaper in Darlington. So far so good. This British medium, Richard Borsonal, featured a photo of W.T. Stead and a real spirit. Yeah, imagine that. Imagine a day where somebody being awarded the Nobel Peace Prize also poses for photo ops with ghosts. You're like, I don't, do we believe all of this or none of this? What's going on? This is so scary. And finally, number one, music for eternity. Before we wrap up this wild part two, I had to include perhaps one of the creepiest patents of all time. Patent numero 9,222,059. Yeah, the number is going a little bit higher. This one got me thinking. I wanted to end this video off on this note. I like this idea. Maybe, I don't know yet. Music for Eternity Systems. Okay, this patent is not from the 1800s, but rather 2015. I know, it's not Victorian, but when else am I gonna talk about this, really? The idea here is that you could stay connected to your loved one by using a solar-powered digital music player. The best part here is the patent details how surviving family members now have the ability to update, revise, and edit stored audio files and programming after burial. Yeah, next Rihanna album, no problem, I got you. There's a speaker in the casket and there's a headphone jack on the tombstone so we can listen together and then we can decide if we hate the album. That's creepy, I wouldn't do this. Would you want this? Sound off below if you'd want, you know, big shiny tunes playing for eternity after you die. I would do the Titanic theme song, just make everyone so sad all the time. Number 10, Queen Victoria. It's all blighty herself. Her Royal Majesty and Queen of the British Empire. Queen Victoria, she's responsible for a lot of things, including a nice long holiday in the summer where dads get to be irresponsible with fireworks. Nice. All fun jokes aside, she was the queen of the monarch and she wasn't the worst queen ever, but uh, during her reign, the British Empire had never really been stronger as it took part in absorbing many smaller nations into the empire. And they didn't ask nicely if you catch my drift. India, China, and uh, a lot of parts of Africa. Africa had a rough time back then. It was pretty hard for that continent. They all felt the wrath of the Queen's expansionist fist. It's really sad, actually. Goddamn. Number nine, thieves. Times, specifically in Victorian London, weren't the best. It most certainly wasn't the cleanliest place on earth, and there were orphans asking for more porridge. I don't know. I didn't read the book, guys. Sorry. Lack of rights, social expectations and pressure, and a lot of double standards. Honestly, it just wasn't an easy time for women. Well, it shouldn't really come as a surprise, but thievery and pickpocketing were often done even by women, though. I mean, what choice do you have at that point? The idea of ladies was so ladylike or elegant that it wasn't possible, or at least people thought it wasn't possible, that they could be criminals. What a backhanded compliment. Well, a woman a criminal? I certainly don't think so, sir. It's not possible. It's very possible. There are tons of thieves and pickpockets. That's just ridiculous. Number eight, Jane Toppin. Take a trip with me to Boston. We can see Bunker Hill, Old North Church, and Fanu Hall. Ooh, cool. We could also visit a very nice nurse from the 1880s who was taking care of the elderly. Jolly Jane, as she became to be known, was a nurse who took care of the elderly. And by take care, I mean the same way you took care of your first hamster. Mmm, yeah, not so great, was it? Now, how did he know that? I know. She would dose up the old geezers with a healthy Keith Richards sized dose of morphine. Yeah! There's only so much rock stars that can handle that level of rock and roll. And guys, grandma and grandpa, they're not one of them. They can't handle that kind of stuff. After that, she would lay down with them and just like chill with the body, cause that's, that's what you do. Ugh. Before she was caught, there was an estimated 31 grandmas and grandpas not at the dinner table after having her as a nurse. I'm just gonna lay down right beside you. It's gonna be great, I'm just gonna lay down. <laughs> Number seven, Typhoid Mary. My mom wasn't the best cook on planet Earth, but God willing, she tried. You know, she, she really put in a lot of work. 
Excuse the meme here, but she makes a mean spaghetti though. God, I love mom's spaghetti. I really, I really do. And her cookies. Oh, she makes the best cookies. Everyone should agree with me in the comments section so I can show my mom and tell her she hasn't made cookies in a while. Tell my mom to make some cookies. It's time she makes cookies, man. They're so freaking good. They're the best on earth, I swear. Well, my mother is okay. She doesn't make up the Gordon Ramsay standards, but that's okay because no matter how well Typhoid Mary made the lamb sauce, it was always gonna make people green as Typhoid Mary was an asymptomatic carrier of typhoid fever. Yes, that's what we're talking about, Typhoid Mary. Crazy enough, after she found out that she was asymptomatic with typhoid, she insisted upon cooking. She kept going, which got more people sick. Surprise. She was forcibly quarantined multiple times in her life. You can't make this stuff up. Please stop cooking, you're sick. I'm gonna do what I want. You can't tell me what to do. Number six, Bell Star. You know, for those who enjoy adult entertainment, her name kind of sounds like it came from there, right? Anyway, she was a cowgirl and outlaw in the 1880s and in the Lone Star State. She was married to an Indian and oftentimes as a couple would offer help to other outlaws needing refuge at their ranch. In 1883, her and her husband were caught trying to steal a horse, very RDR of them, hmm, and spent time in the old slammer. They continued their outlaw ways until it all went Dutch Vanderland, meaning it didn't go very well. One day, like any other good western, a stranger had come to the ranch, kind of out of nowhere, and gave Bell Star a taste of the law. Just happened to be with a big iron. To this day, nobody knows what happened, who the stranger was, or why she was bang bang. No one, no one knows. No one, no one understands. It's crazy. There, was, there should be a movie about that. Big iron on his hip, all fancy anyway. Number five, Mary Surratt. I actually didn't know this one, but perhaps maybe our American audience remembers. Some will recall a time when America was divided in twain. After all, a house divided amongst itself cannot stand. A certain top-hatted bearded president did his best to restore the union. It took a lot of years and lives, but he managed to do it. However, some were still not pleased, a one John Wilkes Booth to be specific had to ask the president a leaded question, if you catch my drift. Well, after assassinating one of the most beloved presidents in American history, he needed to hide. You, you gotta hide after that. And Mary Surratt was the woman who'd let him hide. So I think aiding and abetting, as well as harboring the most wanted man in America at the time, counts as scandalous. She also had some other anti-union behavior as well. Hmm, that's not good. Nazi, Nazi, not very nice. Number four, Lizzie Borden. Lizzie Borden took an axe, gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. Huh, isn't that nice? <laughs> oh boy. Yes, that's right, the late 1800s teenage daughter who maybe perhaps pulled an OJ Simpson. Nah, no, we're not sure, I don't know. Maybe she did not sort of brutally unalive her families. <laughs> no one else was found at the scene and then she was acquitted. That sounds just like OJ. Which given how women were treated back in the day is kind of strange because I, it just feels like women who are clearly not guilty were punished for stuff they didn't do and women who are for sure guilty get off free. Her alibi was that she was in the barn when it happened and then she walked to the house and mom and dad, what's going on here? Let me just wash off my bloody my bloody shorts here. What, what, who did that? What, that's crazy. Number three, Mary Ann Cotton. Marriage can be tough. Sure, but Marianne Cotton is the reason today you can't collect on life insurance when your spouse mysteriously, get your finger quotes out, mysteriously passes away. It all started when she predicted the passing of her stepson, and then it happened. Well, that's weird. After that, it was her husband here, and then another husband there, and well, it's starting to get a little fishy, don't you think? Well, once these unexpected passings were looked into, they all had something in common, something in their tummies. Arsenic. Yes, she was getting rid of her husband's and then trying to claim the insurance money. Evil, but ahead of her time, like 50 years ahead of her time. That's that's insurance fraud. That's interesting. And well, it's also it's also like cold-blooded, calculated, unaliving, you know. But but insurance fraud too. <laughs> Number two, Tilly Kilmick. Okay, how about a literal psychic who knew when all of our late husbands were going to pass? In the late Victorian era, Tilly Kilmick was first found predicting the passing of scruffy wild dogs in the ghettos of Chicago. It's kind of a weird thing to say, like, 
Mm, yeah, see that dog? That dog's not gonna make it. The dog? No, he's not gonna make it. Anyway, <laughs> somehow she always knew when they were going to expire. Then it was her late husband of 29 years. That's kind of strange, 29 years, and he ends up, hmm, that's weird. After cashing the insurance money, which she got immediately, she started dating immediately, where oblivious man after man kept passing, and very shortly after she married more and more. Well, she was a regular Marianne Cotton, to say the least, as she too was using arsenic on her husband to collect insurance money. She eventually was arrested, and her stipulation for being in prison was that she was not allowed to cook for anyone. I think that's fair. That's good. Don't let her cook. Don't, that's a good idea. Number one, ladies of the evening. Love them, hate them, or spend a lot of money on them in Vegas. That's, that's, that's Las Vegas, baby. The era was defined by them, especially in London. Ooh, baby. I mean, at night, you really couldn't walk anywhere without a fair lass daintily waving her hand in hopes of luring in a customer which wasn't really an issue given that bedroom related sicknesses were at an all time high. Syphilis specifically had shockingly high percentage of the population and would make you think twice. Well, it would make us think twice, it would make me think twice, but people back then, uh, they kind of just went for it. Right, is something wrong with you, love? I don't care, let's go anyway. Kicking off the list at number 10, a lot of hair. To kick off this wild part two, I had to include the tale of the woman who ate her own hair. Why did she do it? What happened? How much hair? Well, let's find out. All the questions about to be answered. The Liverpool Daily Post back in 1869 got the attention of those passerbyers with this one. A 30 year old passed away in the village of Lincolnshire. That's not too far off from the average life expectancy of the 1800s. But this case, this case was a little odd. Something was off about it. So doctors asked the family if they could carry out a post mortem. And lo and behold, a two pound solid chunk of hair was sitting in her stomach. It caused ulcerations of the stomach and ultimately caused her death. What a horrible way to go out. The woman's sister didn't know that over the last dozen years or so, she had been casually eating her own hair. Just one piece every now and then. Ultimately, it added up. If you know anybody that's eating their own hair, pass this on. Send them this video. This sounds rather uncomfortable. Number nine, cat attack. If I have to pick, I would say I'm 100% a dog guy. Cats are cool, don't get me wrong, but this next story freaks me out a bit. Also, I had a cat once and I pulled its tail on it. <laughs> pissed at me and scratched me and scared the life out of me. So, dog, dogs for sure. Back in 1870, a rich woman had put her time, energy, and resources into cat breeding. What a fun little hobby and lifestyle. She had tons of cats, she loved them all equally, and they loved her. I'm allergic also, so this story is my nightmare on a level. But it does sound like a cute time, I'll admit, that's a nice way. Especially like in the Victorian era, what a, what a lovely little pocket of fun. 1800s, a lot of candles, everything being extremely flammable, disaster hit often in Victorian times. And in 1870, a fire broke out of this young woman's home, and the cats were sadly trapped in the house. They made it out alive, but by the time they made it out, the two maids that had kicked the door open to rescue them, they had gone full primal. The cats just attacked them and it was all bad. The fire in the house had obviously scared them, so when the doors were open, these two maids were both attacked by them at full force, essentially, all of these cats. Like, what a horrible thank you for saving all of their lives, you know what I mean? Number eight, quick divorce. Let's just say the love thing isn't working out, okay? It happens, people change, but now what? Say it's the Victorian era, but divorce in England isn't allowed until 1857. And it's 1856. So now what are we gonna do? Well, considering what list we're on and which part it is, it's pretty wildly unfair. If you were the wife, you were getting sold in this scenario. How horrible is that? Wife sellers, they were a thing. That was a legitimate business, how horrible. Yeah, you were getting sold if you were the wife, how horrible is that? Wife sellers was a legitimate business. There were auctions, public auctions would be done. You would watch people bid on marrying your wife. At like noon, middle of the day, people are walking by like, oh, do I have any change, hang on. This is insane. One real sale that happened in 1862 was in Selby. The asking price was a beer. The asking price for this person's wife was one pint. Sold, just like that, that's crazy. Sold, drank, now I'm married. That's insane. Other times, most of the time, it was a rather expensive exchange. I feel like there are plenty of cases where this would honestly be the ideal scenario. Just get it done in one day, whatever, peace. See you again, bye, you're the worst. Number seven, the Great Famine. We're gonna lean out of wife selling for a hot minute and include the boys for this one. Yeah, come on back in, you're all guilty. The Great Famine took out everybody, not just Victorian women, of course. Back in 1845, potato crop that a lot of the Irish population was relying on was no longer available all of a sudden. A group of microorganisms just wiped them out, just like that, and in result, around one million folks died or had to leave. 
It was draconian law and British ruling that made the exported food hard to reach people that really needed it. So this famine led to Irish independence and anti-union movements. A little fun bit of history I had to include in this one. Number six, the Brooklyn Theater Stampede. And we're back to absolute horribleness. Here we go. I love the theater. When the pandemic shut down plays, I actually felt pretty sad. I like sitting in full rooms watching a guy in a fake wig monologue about Mozart. Like that's my ideal Saturday night. That's the best. I don't want that to not be a thing anymore. I love theater. But today we have an obnoxious amount of distractions that can take you out of the experience. Guy's texting fighting his ex-girlfriend two rows ahead of me. I'm trying to watch Joseph and the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. I'm like, man, it's not the same anymore. Theater's not the same anymore. Turn off your phone, throw a tomato at him. It can be distracting. Exit signs can also be pretty distracting, but we need them. We definitely need them. Because in 1876, the Brooklyn Theater caught fire after a single lantern fell over on stage during a performance. This was 1876. Everybody was wearing flammable attire. There aren't emergency exits yet. A fire marshal hadn't come in and counted heads at this point, so it was a disaster. 278 people lost their lives. A monument was put up after the incident. It shook the town, it was absolutely horrible. I read about this and I was like, that's horrible. We got included in, this is a horrible list. Number five, the hobble skirt. Yeah, so when people can't get out of burning theaters, it's stuff like this to blame. Just from this 1910 headline alone, I'm glad we don't have hobble skirts anymore. The June 12th, 1910 headline reads, the hobble skirt is the latest freak in women's fashions. The latest freak. Skirts that are so tight around the ankle that locomotion is seriously impeded and speed is impossible. Nice. I'll take two, debit. Doesn't that sound like a bad time? Why would anyone want this? Sounds like you're gonna be late for everything. French designer Paul Poirier made these to free the bust, to free the, you know, have a lot of room in here, whilst shackling the legs. So you, in turn, have to, you can't move. Just what you need to move around uneven stone roads, I guess. Love the practicality on this one, Paul, thanks. Despite how ridiculous and unsafe the hobble skirt looks and acts, only the wealthy could afford such a thing. Shoot, oh man, must be nice. I'll just be over here wearing jeans like an idiot. Middle and lower class women wore skirts with slits or buttons so they could, you know, actually walk around. Yeah, what fools. Oh, sorry, you want a button? <laughs> I don't speak broke, sweetie. Number four, lead based. When I started here at the studio a year and a half ago, maybe two years, I was like, okay, I gotta put on face cream maybe. A lot, of, a lot of lights, a lot of HD this. Time to get rid of these bags under my eyes finally. I don't know, maybe drink some water. See what happens. Finding a skincare routine of any sorts is easy now, dare I say. The lovely World Wide Web has our back. You can learn how to draw your eyebrows on while listening to true crime. It's wonderful where we are today. But the cosmetic game, whew, back in the 18th century, not great. Turns out, wasn't that great. Not that safe. RuPaul's Drag Race would have been a lethal sport, know what I mean? Back in the 18th century, lead mixed with vinegar was often used to make your face look, you know, more pale. The Victorian look, I guess, gotta have those veins pop out. A splash of sulfur for those freckles. Horrible idea. Queen Elizabeth I used cosmetics containing lead, mercury, and or arsenic. The same poison that took out George III and Napoleon Bonaparte. So, not safe at all in any time, period. In fact, arsenic was on the priority list of hazardous substances, and toxic metal exposure is still an issue we're facing in this era, let alone Victorian. Number three, the Kensington system. Ah, oh, this was horrible. Queen Victoria was brought up under the Kensington system, which if you haven't heard it before is awful. I was grounded more often than not growing up, I'll admit, you know, I was the youngest of three, so I tried some shady stuff every now and then, but this, this is another level. At least I could go to the washroom without supervision. You know what I mean? Yeah, buckle up. Victoria's mother, Duchess Victoria of Kent, she created this Kensington system to control her daughter. She literally isolated the child from friends, family members, anybody, everybody, you name it. Her mother would monitor her every action on top of this, including who she can see or speak to, if there were any of those people at some point. Victoria only had two playmates growing up her entire life. She had her half-sister, Princess Fiodora of Lenigan, and then the Duchess attendant, Sir John Conroy, his daughter, Victoria. I mean, I had like four friends growing up, you know, maybe five, five and a half, but this is just cruel, this is just unfair. Especially with a royalty too, you'd think you can have more things. No, less. She shared a room with her mother until she was a queen. That entire time, she literally couldn't walk down the hallway alone. Victoria has reflected on her childhood, and yeah, in case you're wondering, she hates John Conrad. She referred to him as a demon incarnate, so 
She's got the words. Number two, arsenic dresses. If looks could kill, literally. You've heard of arsenic and old lace at some point, but what exactly are we talking about? Back in 1861, a poet by the name of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, real name, his wife, Fanny, also real name, her dress caught on fire and her burns were so bad that of course she sadly didn't survive. But this was sadly common in Victorian days. Puffy dresses, open candles as we heard earlier. These dresses back then, they were flammable as is, but some of them were made with literal poison. Some of them had arsenic made to have that like green look, like the real arsenic green look. It wasn't just in clothing either. Back in 1861, an artificial flower maker named Matilda Schurer used green arsenic laced powder and her fingernails had turned green and green foam started coming out of her mouth and it was just a horrible way to go out. Arsenic's not supposed to be inhaled, let alone worn. Although yeah, it did look nice for a hot minute. Not worth it. And finally, number one, Queen Victoria's threats. Being the queen and all, and we're talking about the Victorian era, I figured we'd end with this one. Being the queen and all, a security team is always needed, and during her reign, there were multiple, multiple attempts to harm the young queen. The first attack was back in 1840. It was an 18 year old man named Edward Oxford, and he fired towards the queen's carriage, but obviously and luckily missed. But when Edward was accused of high treason, he was actually found not guilty due to insanity. Then a couple years later, in 1842, it happened again. This time, two men fired at her. They were found guilty. In 1849, her carriage was attacked by William Hamilton. In 1850, as the carriage was passing the gates of Buckingham Palace, Robert Pate, a retired soldier, ran up and hit her with his cane. Victoria was okay, thankfully, but of course, she was shook. Then again in 1842, 1849, and 1872, attempt after attempt. But then things got a little worse. If you haven't heard of Boy Jones or anything that happened here, I saved it for last because it's extremely unsettling. A teenager stalked the queen back in 1838 until 1841. Edward Jones, AKA Boy Jones. This guy somehow managed to break into Buckingham Palace more than once. It was some Assassin's Creed type stuff. He just knew some back way, he climbed some window or whatever. The guy just knew a route in. So he would break in and would more often than not just hide under the queen's sofa. He would sit on her throne sometimes and one of the worst things ever, he would go through her drawers and like go through her clothes and stuff, it was creepy. He would steal her clothes until eventually and thankfully he got caught. Of all the things you can do, of all the crimes you want to commit in the Victorian era, you're gonna go hide under a couch for five years? Okay, I'm glad he got caught, but just so weird. What a weird ending. Number 10 is chloroform the hiccups away. Nowadays we know a nasty case of hiccups is curable by just holding your breath or chugging a bunch of water. But if this was 1899, you'd be prescribed chloroform. Known by many as the mysterious liquid on the rag placed over the, someone's face to make them faint in many period pieces or cartoons, chloroform gained popularity after Queen Victoria demanded its usage during her labor in 1853. After having been denied it in her previous labors. By taking these lengths to reduce the annoyance of hiccups, your vital organs may pay a steep price. Chloroform has the potential to damage the nervous system, lungs, and trachea, as well as the liver and kidney when exposed long term. This is just one of many medical remedies that we'll be covering from the first Merrick Manual of Diagnosis and Therapy, the oldest continuously published English language medical textbook. All the quack treatments in our list today used to be found in this mass encyclopedia. For instance, number 9 in our countdown is smoke inhalation for asthma and other lung conditions. Conditions. This may be one of the more counterintuitive remedies on our list, as it's easy to see now that smoke is not beneficial for asthma at all. Through the late 19th and into the next, however, inhaling smoke or smoke, as well as stramonium, a hallucination inducing nightshade, as well as lobelia, known for its sedative properties, were popular treatments for asthmatics. Asthma is caused when your airways can narrow or swell while producing excess mucus. Smoking meanwhile has been shown to eventually reduce the number of cilia, the lungs filaments which help transport mucus into the lungs, which only leads to the worsening of asthma symptoms. This wasn't the only weird tobacco smoke belief however, in 1872 an English newspaper talked of tobacco smoke enemas which even reported that hundreds of lives might have been spared by the tobacco smoke enema. Okay. Weird enough. Plasters, no not the British word for band-aids, is number 8. This medical treatment was said to have sucked the badness out of a person. They were like a nicotine patch made up of a thin layer sheet of wax as well as leather and it was able to stick onto the skin. In the wax there were remedies such as lead, opium, frankincense, tobacco, etc. This mix would be applied while still warm to ensure the adhesion of the plaster. Plasters were sold to anyone of any age and came in many different shapes and sizes so that they may be applied to different areas. What were they used for? Everything. 
cough, cold, period pain, organ failure, alcoholism, headache, the list can go on forever. Seeing as they wanted the patch to pull as much badness from the body as possible, these patches could be left on for two days to two weeks to forever. Without washing, of course. Naturally, these patches trapped in a lot of moisture that could cause infections, blisters, rashes, and hives underneath, especially once the patch is removed and the skin is finally exposed to air. Arsenic, like plasters, was a cure all, and it's number seven in the countdown. If you've seen our other video, Top 10 Unusual Fashion Trends from the Victorian Era, you might know that arsenic was in everything in the Victorian era. Makeup, wallpaper, dye. No exception was made in medicine either as arsenic was prescribed for anything from anemia in Merrick's diagnosis manual to anthrax, cancer, reduced libido, syphilis, or even cholera. While it was most popular to consume arsenic, it could also be inhaled or injected. Being a byproduct of smelting, it's no wonder arsenic was everywhere during the industrial revolution as there was an excess of it. So it was incredibly accessible and a household remedy. Since doctors already prescribed it to do so much, everyday people just start to use it to treat any common ailment. Unsurprisingly, many people suffered arsenic poisoning symptoms. The ailments are now referred to as Fowler's disease. Number six is all kinds of gross and questionable. The everlasting pill. When the Merck manual was first published, part of the comprehensive treatment plan for an eruptive fever, which is a classification for diseases like scarlet fever, smallpox, and chickenpox, was actually laxatives. Castor oil was the main laxative choice for Victorians up until until the debut of the everlasting pill, made up of a metal now known to be toxic called antimony, would be invented. Swallowing this would induce severe vomiting and diarrhea, thus giving the body what they thought to be a healthy cleanse, and their intention was to purge diseases from the body. It earned the name the everlasting pill, as the pill would pass through the gastric system mostly intact, meaning it could be retrieved and cleaned for future use. Seeing as the metal was greatly valuable at the time, it was quite common to keep it in the family and hand it down generation to generation. Imagine getting that in your granny's will. Watch out, it may shock ya. Number five is shock treatment. When profit can be made off of insecurity, unsavory business flourishes. Victorians honed in on the man's moral weaknesses as a cause for erectile dysfunction, and impotence was thought to be caused by either too much sex and masturbation or not enough. So doctors took a few shocking routes, literally, such as galvantic baths or bathtubs filled with electrodes, which were supposed to restore sexual desire in an advertised six sessions. For a more direct approach, a thin rod with running electric current could be placed up into a man's ear. Repeat that twice a week, about five minutes each time, and your little man should be ready to rumble. By the late 1800s, ads were running for electric belts aimed at weak men. They claimed to help cure kidney pain and sciatic nerve issues and backaches and headaches and nervous exhaustion, and of course, mainly their dysfunction. While today impotence is recognized as the result of physical or mental duress, age, or genetics, the belief that electric shock therapy is a useful cure for impotence still persists, and some studies have shown positive signs. See that, fellas? Don't knock it till you try it. Speaking of electrocuting genitals, you can't tell me that didn't happen at least once with the first electric vibrators, which is number four in our countdown. Female hysteria became a diagnosable medical condition way back in medieval times when the concept of a wandering uterus, when a discontented or displaced uterus would cause a woman ill health, was first coined. Believed to have symptoms such as irritability, insomnia, fainting, anxiety, menstruation, or horniness, pretty much every woman showed these symptoms. Hysteria was pretty common. Doctors cure hysterical paroxysm, an orgasm. For hundreds of years leading up to this invention, doctors were manually administering pelvic massages to women to achieve the necessary cure. But all that wrist work added up over time and doctors needed a break. So cue Dr. Joseph Mortimer Granville. He created an electric steam powered electromechanical medical instrument, nicknamed the manipulator. The device allowed women to give themselves home massages to cure their wandering wounds and giving doctors the well-deserved break they needed. A questionable cure for a very questionable diagnosis. Number three is not for the faint of heart. They loved leeches. It may be crazy to imagine, but between the late 1700s and well into the early 1900s, there was a booming leech trade all across Europe. Leeches were shipped from Germany to America by the tens of thousands. England even had to start importing them from France by the mid-1800s as their own leech stocks were not even enough to supply their own doctors. Francis Bersuyas, 
believed that all diseases resulted from the excess buildup of blood and documented this belief in a medical journal that would subsequently cause leeches to become the go to treatment in France and then later spread across Europe. This usage of leeches then became worldwide from there and so obscene that the creatures started to go extinct. However, what these quacks didn't know is that bloodletting was very, very, very rarely beneficial to any conditions, and applying leeches often resulted in detrimental side effects such as blood loss, diarrhea, and vomiting, or those with poor immune systems could even be exposed to hazardous bacteria and infection, let alone death from hemorrhagic shock for literally anyone they did this to. Eventually, the excessive use of leeches meant that they became too expensive to ship, too scarce due to the over farming to find, and medically obsolete in the face of new science that questioned the medical merits of bloodletting. Thank God. Number two doesn't allow you to touch where number one usually comes out. It's the masturbatory mental illness. Obviously, it's natural, normal, and well, fun, but the Victorian perspective of masturbation was nowhere near what it is today, as our old timely friends saw it as a serious threat to mental and physical health, or even could kill. You. Self love was seen as an ultimate evil, but beyond moralistic arguments, many physicians thought that every orgasm drained a man's energy. Married men were warned by doctors to limit the amount of sex they were having, while unmarried men were encouraged and urged to conserve their essence by avoiding sex altogether, particularly masturbation. Even wet dreams and uncontrolled ejaculation were considered a sexual dysfunction, as masturbation essentially became the male version of hysteria. So, how did did you treat this condition? Men had to stop masturbating. Fear and shame campaigns did what they do best and stimulated the market to provide quick quack remedies. They came in the form of anti masturbation devices that looked like torture chambers. Most popular was the jugum, which was a metal ring attached around the base of a man's, you know, and then screwed on. If he was to become erect at any point, whether awake or asleep, the now inflated skin would make contact with sharp metal teeth that would dig in. Like I said, most popular. Consider how much worse these other options were for that to be the primo choice. A spermatic truss was essentially the first jock strap, but meant for every day. And the Bowden device fastened a little metal helmet to the end of a man's member that bound up into his pubic hair so that it would be ripped out should he become erect. I'm more than happy to keep going, but I'm sure more than enough people are wincing right now. Keep in mind, while these men were going through this to avoid masturbation, women were being prescribed it as a cure. Number one on our countdown may be a bit of a surprise. Surgery. How could surgery be a questionable treatment? Well, it itself isn't, but the men performing it and their hygiene towards surgery were. Most famous is Robert Liston. Said to be able to remove a leg in 30 seconds, he notoriously used his own mouth to hold scalpels, knives, and even once sucked the pus out of a woman's throat wound. According to medical historian Dr. Lindsay Fitzharris, surgeons never washed their instruments or their hands, and Victorian surgeons were known for wearing old surgery garments out of prowess, reportedly so stiff with old blood that they were nearly cardboard in appearance. Even the operating tables themselves were rarely washed down, and it was said a visitor to St. George's Hospital in London 1825 discovered mushrooms and maggots thriving in the damp, dirty sheets of a patient's bed. When asked why they hadn't complained, the patient assumed this to be the norm. And what about surgery in the moment? Well, the patients were conscious and undrugged as they were operated on, and surgeries needed to be fast as a result. One in four people died after their surgery, whether it was still on the operating table or from infections afterwards. But what about our buddy I mentioned, Dr. Liston? Only 1 in 10 of his patients died. This was because of his speed. Time me gentlemen, time me, he'd shout to the surgery spectators to put his legendary speed to the test. Sure, he did accidentally castrate somebody once because of his wild motions, but nobody's perfect. In fact, while he's remembered for being the first surgeon to use anesthesia, wash his knives, and invent a still used medical tool, he is the only surgeon to ever have a 300% death rate. I'd be remiss not to mention that during a leg amputation, his lightning speed reportedly cut off three fingers of the assistant who had been holding down the patient. Then, as he brought the knife back up, he slashed the coat of a spectator. The spectator reportedly died immediately of fright, likely a heart attack. Though the assistant and patient survived initially, like most who were treated in Victorian hospitals, they died not long after from infection, which was also just called hospitalism at the time because of how many people died that way. It's easy to say that going to a Victorian Victorian surgery or a hospital may have been as efficient as rubbing dirt into a wound. Number 10, Boy Jones. What's more intimate than a stalker? Am I right, ladies? If there's one thing women have loved throughout history, it's having every second of their privacy being watched by some creepy man, right? 
No. I can only imagine it's been worse since the dawn of smartphones and social media. I just, that must be horrible. Well, as it turns out, there were some real creep wads in the Victorian era too. The boy Jones was a stalker of Queen Victoria who on multiple occasions snuck his way into Buckingham Palace, one time escaping with a pair of the Queen's underwear. What? Arrested multiple times but still somehow found his way back to the palace. But what they should have done was swap the queen's underwear for a pair of mine after a shift in the garden center I used to work at. Oh yeah, nobody's coming for you after sniffing those bad boys. Oh! Number 9. Graceful Words this was a time when ladies were supposed to be ladies, and that means manners are on the table and elbows are off. Dresses were worn to not show ankles, god forbid an ankle or wrist bust out. I think more importantly however, or rather unusual that is, is that women were expected to talk a certain way. Good evening Mr. Barrows, you must excuse my tardiness, there was a dreadful man screaming at me because my ankles were shown whilst mounting my carriage. Your what was showing love? Oh you heard it, I can't believe it, excuse me, I must be someone else. I don't need to tell you guys how ridiculous that is. I say fly out the handle ladies, wear what you want, do what you want. Number 8. Shots. Not the kind I like. Well, I don't know about you guys, but nothing ruins the mood for me and my lady like being fired upon. Yikes. I'd like to stay the night kid, but the automatic gunfire coming from outside is starting to get to me. See? All gangster impressions aside, things must have been that way for poor Queen Victoria as she was shot in her carriage in 1840. A young man fired two shots at her carriage. More attacks would actually follow in the coming years. It's kind of hard to feel that certain kind of way after bullets go grazing past your pretty face. The worst thing that ever happened to my generation was making sure nobody was home when you were studying with your boyfriend. I was too busy playing Call of Duty, but at least I never got actually shot at. You know what I mean? That's just a good thing. Number 7. Expectations. Alright, this one goes out to all the married ladies in the audience. Hello, how are you? I'm doing great, thanks for asking. I'm curious as to why you got married and what your expectations were. Did you marry your high school sweetheart and live happily ever after? Maybe you had a shotgun wedding and after one night at the saloon. Maybe you just really wanted to find a nice man and settle down, start a family, be a mother. I think any of those options are great, so as long as you have options. In Victorian England, you were expected to do the latter. Women were expected to get married and have kids, and that's about it really. My question is, why were angles and wrists an issue but giving birth isn't? What I mean is it's kind of a compromising position to be in. All I'm asking is that the girls get treated fairly and given choices and be allowed to show some ankle. Doesn't make any sense. You can look at her business down there, but you can't show an ankle. That doesn't make any sense. I'm a magician. Number six, double standard. Divorce sucks. It's no fun. The person you once loved and cherished is now the villain in your story. I love McDonald's and I don't ever want them to be the villain in my story. I love you guys. Gotta get those Happy Meals. Divorce is something that isn't new. Honestly, it was probably invented the second after marriage was. In Victorian times, men had the right to divorce their wife if they had committed adultery. Women could not. Well, if you refer to my last part, you know that men were doing more than a little window shopping when it came to women. When men left town for business, they would have hired the services of a woman who patrol the streets at night. No, I'm not talking about Batwoman either. So men can divorce women if they dare to do what they did on a regular basis. Yeah, that's that's totally fair. Not yeah, that's good. Equal. Absolutely. Yeah. Number five, emo girl. All the forever alone people, raise your hand. Let me hear you roar XD. I like to joke around a lot and say I'm a lawyer, a firefighter, and the cutest guy on the whole wide internet. But if there's one thing I know, it's people. I like people. I love them. I spend a lot of time with them and after hearing this, I've come to the conclusion that this is where the emo girls come from. I figured it all out. It's down to a science. I'm a scientist now. Do you ever get that feeling in your tummy on Valentine's Day because you know it's going to be another one alone? And you'll be forced to be on your own and, and, and that means sad music and crying in your room. Same, it's, it's Drake's Marvin room for me. Well, single women in Victorian times had similar issues. Since women were expected to marry and have kids, single women who were also forever alone were pitied by society, which I argue is just way worse. Who, who, no one wants to be pitied. Ugh. Number four, gold diggers. She take my money when I'm in need. 
As you drive it. Okay, anyway, back to the actual content. Well, not exactly. While today in a place like sunny California, you might see an older man with a woman who's half his age. Maybe he's driving a nice car or she's got on the very best and latest from Louis Vuitton. Stylish, yeah. Most of us think some thoughts about what we might think is going on there. We can kind of be judgmental sometimes when we see things like that. However, looking through a lens of 2022 to Victorian times might make the women of Victorian times appear to be gold diggers, but in reality, it was because all of their financials were tied to their husbands, legally too. Which, if you can imagine, that system didn't work too well. What if your husband is broke? What if your husband is running amok with sultry lasses on the street corners? Like I said before, no divorce, but even if she could leave him easily, supporting herself afterwards was going to be an issue, especially financially. Number three, birth factory. Just pump them out. The faster the better. Quantity over quality, just, just get them out. The use of birth control, as you can tell, was not a common practice. Anyone who's over the age of 25, Ask your grandparents how many brothers and sisters they have. I'm willing to bet it's in the six to eight range. Let me know in the comments below, I'm curious. A trend that would continue for a few decades after. Education is important, and I'll get to that in my next part. Women were simply expected to act this way. Maybe it was the sign of the times since the Industrial Revolution was in full swing. Maybe the factories needed workers, I don't know. Which in case you didn't know, they used children as employees. Maybe not so nice. Unfortunately, that was when there was an issue, and there were many. They had no HR to go to, and that was the least of their worries, really. Number two, no school for you. No higher education for women. Banned from going to university. I don't think so, not very nice, no, no. Honestly, any society that doesn't want half of their population to go to school probably has a few things to work out. It's a boys club and they can only go to university so that they can learn to be smarter and be businessmen, so they can earn money and thus have the facilities to court a woman who really doesn't have a choice anyway. Women had jobs, not careers. And they were all the jobs that you can think of. The ones that were too feminine for men as women were too feeble to participate in a men's job, which is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. I'm happy to say that in 2022, we showed them wrong. Chetty loves everyone. Just remember that, I love everybody. You go, girls. Number one, strict rules. Okay, so after a night in the bed sheets with the gal that you love, or maybe the one that you found, there's a good chance that nine months later, a smaller version of you two could be walking around. A byproduct of intimacy, if you will. This was always something I wanted to rant about, but I always found it strange how strict parents and teachers from this time were with their kids. You gotta brush your hair, bed made, and whatever you do, don't ask for more gruel. Please sir, could I have some more? Whatever that Charles Dickens book was, I think it was Oliver Twist. They made us read those books as kids, and I don't know why, because they're kind of boring. From the extreme military code ethics happening at home to the long days in a factory at work, being a kid was tough, man. Earning the punk rock blues of today. I'm just a kid and my life is a nightmare. Number 10, no calling, no gifts. This is a time in history when men were told to be gentle and women told to be ladies. Naturally, that came with some weird social practices. For instance, women were discouraged from accepting gifts from men. Personally, I like to give my girlfriend flowers and chocolate. I'm a classic guy, what can I say? Can't go wrong with that. However, even if a handsome silver-tongued devil such as myself were to give some flowers and the finest dark chocolate a 7-Eleven has to offer, and a most promising woman were to accept said gifts, she may not be able to call me back. Literally because but well, the phone isn't exactly a thing yet, and also because that's something else women were just discouraged from doing. Pfft, call on a man? Pfft, no way, Jose, even if he is super nice and waiting for a genuine response. One etiquette guidebook from 1882 called any woman who calls on a man ill-bred and positively improper to do so. I like when people give me flowers and chocolate. Maybe call me sometimes, I'm a little lonely. Number nine, act like a lady. How dare ladies do anything unladylike? Oh, said every man ever in the Victorian era. This is a time in history when ladies gotta be ladylike. That means makeup, corsets, and, and don't you dare do anything masculine. Oh, that's me angry. This is still a time when food isn't the greatest either, so imagine if you got an upset tummy at the dinner table. Happens to me a lot. You've got a handsome prince that your parents have arranged for you to marry. When you go to greet him, you do it with a simple gesture, as kneeling to curtsy could turn your linens a certain shade of embarrassment that 1800 stain cleaning technology could never wash away. You'd poop yourself. Where's Billy Mays when you need him, right? 
How dare a woman do such things as go number two, or even worse, break wind? Oh, the nerve. That's just the way it went, folks. I don't make the rules. Number eight, charged with love. Naturally, this was the past, and not being open to homosexuality was just the way it was. Especially when tucking yourself into bed at night alone wasn't allowed either. Homosexuality just wasn't gonna happen. They, they just weren't gonna be approved of it. It's just how it goes. It sucks. However, it's almost as if there's been love on this earth since day one, and to stop that kind of love, it's just silly, man. Wherever I go, everyone is welcome on this channel or my Twitch. Chetty loves everyone, because in reality, this is a time period where you could wind up in jail for that kind of love. And as Awesome Powers would say, that's just not very groovy, baby, yeah. Strangely enough, homosexual relationships between women might have been completely overlooked, as they were sometimes mistaken for women being friends. Yeah, I know. Some women even lived together. But given that they probably needed each other for financial support, people just kind of thought that's how it went, and they ignored it. It's like they live together, and you start putting the pieces together, and it's like, you know, they, I don't know, something weird going on there. But love everybody, come on, be nice. Number seven, a good thing. If I'm talking about medieval times, there's a good chance I'm gonna bring up the super not cool, not fun, do not condone or support the behavior of marrying a woman at the age of 12. Yucky. In part one, I mentioned that there was a ton of corners and streets being worked by the only other job besides street cleaners at 3 a.m. by women. However, after venereal disease was becoming a serious issue, it was getting pretty bad. It was becoming clear that a lot of people who were getting sick were young women. Like, 11 to 16 age group. Oof. Which I shouldn't have to tell you is bad. That, that's pretty bad, dude. When I was 16, I was rocking Black Ops 2, hanging out with my buddies, and partying hard in the summer. I got a lot of good stories. Maybe I'll share them one day. Catching all that nasty stuff is no way to spend your youth. So thank God the government changed the age of consent to 16 years old, which I know is not a solution for everything that was going on, but it was a small step forward in the right direction. That's what we like. Good history moving forward. We like that. Chetty likes. Number six, the seam seamstress. Being that the Industrial Revolution had started and business was booming, people needed to travel for business. Or more specifically, men needed to travel for business. Which means they gotta be away from their wives, and that means they are away from the very thing we're talking about today. Bedroom stuff. How did men solve this issue? Well, there was no shortage of ladies roaming street corners to uh, aid in, in that matter. However, there's an option with a little less syphilis. There were AIDS or early blow-up dolls called travel ladies. Strangely enough, it was stored in a gentleman's hat. What? That's so wrong. Once it was ready to be used, it was inflated and reassembled. This is a quote from an ad from one of the products. It is inflated to the essential part of the woman wanted by a man. That just, that just doesn't sound very good. This is why we have boards of people to check stuff from products before it gets shipped out to the public. I feel like that just wouldn't fly very well today. Number five. Big polluter. This just doesn't make any sense. It never did to me. And it still doesn't. But in case you didn't know, self-pleasure was a big no-no. Commonly called self-pollution. Which honestly is very funny to me. That's just hilarious. Don't self-pollute yourself, Chris. That's bad. Don't do that. That's naughty. It was a sin and thought to be a cause for many ailments. I'm sure you've heard the classic saying that for guys, if you decided to go bump in the night by yourself, there's a good chance you'd need a walking stick because it would make you go blind. Women were also targeted, however, as for any pearl polishing by women was thought to be hysteric and needed to be treated for such. Look, the truth is, any man who wants to wax his carrot or woman tuning a one dial radio should be able to do so without judgment of society or medical remedies of snake oil doctors. Love yourself, love everybody else, and just, as long as the bedroom door's closed, you're good. Just, just don't do it in public, you're good. Number four, shake and bake. I'm something of a scientist myself, but that doesn't mean I know everything, and if you actually need to learn something about health and safety, take it from a professional, not a second-rate John Candy. However, when coming across this fact, I just had to share it, because with my medical knowledge, this just doesn't sound right. All right, so, kids, we know how they're made. I don't need to go into detail for that. However, there was this idea back in the Victorian days that if a woman danced shortly after doing what mommy and daddies do, then there was a chance that her pregnancy just wouldn't happen. Or perhaps, more commonly, after riding a horse. S same idea, uh, okay. Which is frankly, 
horse. I mean, come on. My mom always told me when she was baking that I had to be quiet and stop running around the house or the cake she was baking wouldn't rise. Well, they always did. I love chocolate cake. I mean, really, I do. I'm starting to wonder if there's a connection here. I was a rowdy kid. Number three, the Kensington system. Poor Queen Victoria. I know this is kind of a stretch, but it relates back to the whole mistreating women thing. But basically, it was something implemented in order to control the young royal, make her dependent on her mother, whom she was not allowed to be without. Basically, modern day strict parents. Now, all the kids watching right now, or all the kids who've grown up, how well did that parenting work? Let us know in the comments. I'm willing to bet it created a little bit of a divide between parent and child, am I right? That's exactly what happened with Queen Victoria. Shouldn't be surprised, really. Being a parent is tough. I get that. But squeeze too hard and the sand falls through the cracks of your hand. Victoria wasn't even allowed an hour to herself. And I don't care who you are, no matter how charismatic or bubbly, everybody needs some alone time. Number two, a healthy breakfast. Okay, not Victorian London, but this is just too funny not to mention, and it's around the same time period, very close. As the great minds of the time thought, self-pollution was a big no-no, and the reason for these urges was often related to food. Some thought eating meat would make you down bad, so a man named John Harvey Kellogg, you might have heard of him, aimed to cure the sickness of self-love. What if a man had a delicious, nutritious meal to eat, especially at the start of his day? Cornflakes! by Kellogg's, the, the very same cereal that's probably sitting on top of your fridge, yeah, was partially originally designed to stop you from feeling those carnal urges. Now, not sure if that works. I mean, go ahead and tell me how you feel after eating a bowl of that. I had one this morning. I feel fine. I don't feel any different at all. I mean, I'm just, well, I'm not really feeling the same about Pam Anderson anymore, though. Number one, rising action. This could get some married couples into some trouble if they're watching. So sorry. It's gonna be hard to talk about this without saying it because YouTube will send a stern letter if I do, but here it goes. The deed was not considered done unless both parties had signed off on it, uh, had their toes curled, reaching the peak, your magnum opus, the way I feel when I eat at McDonald's, DEFCON 1, or simply mispronouncing organisms in health class. I feel like once you're involved, you're involved. And to me, that's a done deal. You can't really reverse it from that point on, regardless of any of my euphemisms, but that's what they thought. They thought if you didn't, you both didn't climb that mountain together, it didn't happen. Cause science. 